a dedicated family man. He was the best grandpa I could ever ask for for my kids. He loved his family. He was always there for everyone. And a pillar of the community. He helped a lot of the people who were down on their luck. He was changing everyone's life. Is senselessly murdered. We noticed what looked like burn marks. Is this a torture type crime? Was he actually tortured? Detectives follow a trail of evidence. I noticed my dad's truck was gone. We knew that this truck was a key to solving this homicide. That reveals devastating betrayals. Hardy would employ people from drug rehab centers. You look at him and you're thinking that if anybody could do it, this guy could do it. Then a surprise lead reveals a killer no one imagined. I told you guys everything I know. No, you haven't. We're pretty excited. We're just about to go nuts. It was a moment, I'll say that. I never thought he would do something like that. He's not the guy I would have picked to have committed this crime. I was in complete shock. Ardmore, Oklahoma is an honest, hardworking town built on family values. We're a town of about 25,000 people, and it's a wonderful community. It's a great place to live because you can have that large town feel and then yet come home to the small town atmosphere as well. On the evening of November 15th, 2019, that small town feeling is shattered when police respond to a 911 call. I had just sat down to eat when the phone rang and it was dispatch advising me that officers were out on a possible homicide. Police are checking in on a local man who hasn't been seen or heard from in several days. They arrived, immediately looked in the window, could see the victim was laying face down in the floor, and they could see blood, so they forced their way into the residence. They knew immediately that he was deceased. Minutes later, homicide detectives arrive at the scene. The living room was just in disarray. There was items kicked over. There was blood on the couch. There was blood spatter on nearby items in the living room, the TV and pictures. And so we knew that there was a struggle that had taken place in that room. When the detectives look at the body, they recognize the dead man. I knew the victim. It was Marty Lucas. Most of the police officers knew who Marty was. Marty helped in the community. He helped a lot of the people who were down on their luck. Marty was a, a nice guy. Detectives have to determine why 63-year-old Marty Lucas would be the target of such a heinous crime. With the amount of trauma that Marty had suffered, it was a pretty violent, bloody scene. You can see a lot of blood that has pooled around the body. You can see blood on the back of the body, on the head, and we knew that this was a death as a result of a beating or a blunt force trauma. It's obvious that there was quite a struggle. Marty had hair in his hands. He had abrasions on his hands. I think he fought for his life. We noticed that there were pieces of what appeared to be a rock that had some moss on them. We found parts of it over by the couch where there was a large blood stain and then parts of it over by him. We walked the exterior of the residence trying to find where maybe a rock would have come from. Immediately under the carport, there is a rock pathway. The walkway was missing a rock. So immediately we thought, well, whoever it was that did this took a rock from there and brought it with him. That indicated to us that this was premeditated. And so we believe that he or she had used it as a weapon against Marty, and, and in the process of that, it was broken. We didn't find very large pieces of it, and so we believe that the, the majority of that rock was taken from the scene. Police discover unusual markings on the body. We noticed what looked like burn marks on his shirt, like his shirt had been ironed. My initial reaction was not only has he been hit by an iron, he's been burned by an iron. Is this a torture type crime? Was he actually tortured? And so we believe maybe early on that the iron could have been a murder weapon, in, or at least an additional murder weapon in this case. But what could have been the motive for such a violent attack? where his wallet would have been. Someone had reached in and taken his wallet because you could see the blood transfer, a handprint, like sliding down into his pants almost. We were pretty clear that this was a crime involving a robbery and theft. His wallet was missing along with his phones. Detectives make one more important observation. 
We thought whoever had killed Marty knew him because there wasn't a sign of forced entry. As investigators work, Marty's son Michael arrives at the scene. I went to his house. It was a nightmare. It was the worst day of my life. I was in shock once I seen what was actually inside. My husband called me. He said, my dad's dead. Someone killed him. And he was just screaming in my ear. He's like, I can't believe someone would kill my dad. I was in complete shock. He was such a nice person. Who would want to hurt him? Marty Lucas was born into a military family in 1956. After graduating high school, Marty got married and had two children, Jennifer and Michael. Michael and his dad were very, very close. He loved his family. He was always there for everyone, you know. He made sure to make time for everyone. I used to call him Papa Smurf because he's just really funny, he's short. He's just a real, you know, bubbly person. My parents, they divorced when I was pretty young. Marty had struggles when my husband was a child and a teenager. He had a substance abuse problem. He had been in and out of trouble with the police, petty crimes that was a result of that addiction. In 2007, Marty got a second chance when he was offered a job as a carpenter and found renewed purpose in life. From then on, he straightened up and started his own business. Did really well. He turned his life around. He was one of the few success stories that I'm aware of in my career. Marty threw everything into rebuilding his life and his family. He taught me a lot of work-related skills at an early age. He let me start working with him when I was 12 years old. And my son, he's eight. He's already starting working him, basically, showing him skills like he did me when I was young. He was the best grandpa I could ever ask for for my kids. Marty never forgot the second chance he'd been given and vowed to pay it forward. Marty would usually go to the halfway houses and get people that had just got out of jail or they have a hard time with their life and see if they would want to work for him. Basically, just giving workers second chances. He knew where they was coming from. He's been in their shoes. He taught these men and women new skills. He treated them with the utmost respect. Now investigators are left asking, who would want to bludgeon this well-respected contractor and caring grandfather to death? He really had no enemies. And just to see that the way that he died was so brutal, it was very difficult to know that someone would be capable of doing something like that. As detectives finish up at the crime scene, they turn to Marty's son, who gives them a crucial lead. When I showed up, I noticed that my dad's truck was gone. That really threw me off because he wouldn't even let me drive his truck. He wouldn't loan the truck out to no one. It was a Chevy pickup that originally had belonged to Marty's father. That truck was everything to him. Detectives put out a bolo or be on the lookout for the missing truck. We needed to find the truck and maybe hope that either the suspect was still driving it or that they left behind evidence that we could identify him. We knew that this truck was a key to solving this homicide. Investigators ask Marty's loved ones who they think would have seen him last. We found out that Marty had been missing two or three days prior to the Friday the 15th that we found his body. And one of the things we were told by family and friends is that Marty goes to this Valero gas station every morning to get coffee. The Valero had video that pointed down the street that the crime occurred on. The manager said that Marty had arrived last at that store on Tuesday morning. Detectives search the security footage. On the day after Marty was last seen alive and three days before his body was found, the truck appears. Marty's truck was very unique, dark green color with custom wheels. This green truck was in a big hurry and it pulled out in front of a semi truck and it was almost in an accident that we had captured on video. Investigators need to track down Marty's truck and whoever is behind the wheel. We thought if we find the truck, we're probably going to find our suspect. This is going to be our guy. Coming up, detectives uncover suspects with dark pasts. They said, violent. I thought, good lord, he gets violent. I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> she had frequented a lot of the local casinos. She knew he had large sums of cash. This was the break that we needed. And the trail leads to an unlikely killer. 
after you're not going to think that this is someone who could kill somebody. And that kind of broke open a whole new layer of the case. The investigation took off at warp speed because we think we've got our guy. Police investigating the murder of 63-year-old contractor Marty Lucas have obtained gas station surveillance video of someone driving his truck the day after he was last seen. We collected hours and hours of video from the store. We were able to piece together some events that happened before and after the homicide. The footage shows a busy street a few blocks from Marty's house. When detectives scour the rest of the security tapes, something grabs their attention. On Wednesday morning, just after daylight, you can see a gentleman walking from the direction of Motel 6. And that person was walking towards Marty's home. Is this unidentified man involved in Marty's murder? You can see the suspect. Then an hour later, you can see on the video that there's one guy in the truck, that there's a single person in the truck. And so we thought he might be the same person that was in that video. Marty did not allow just anyone to drive this truck. In fact, he did not allow anyone to drive this truck. We had to follow the stolen truck. That was really going to be our key to solving this case. While officers continue their search for the truck, detectives return to speak to Marty's family and friends. That's one of the things we were trying to just nail down is, who has Marty been hanging out with lately? Who has he been working with? Who has he had problems with, if anyone? Police learn that along with helping people back up on their feet, Marty often forged friendships with those he employed. Marty would become close with some of the men that he worked with or that he would hire and try to get to know them. There's probably about six or seven of them I actually got pretty close to. He built up friendships with them. Amanda and Jason, Marty's neighbors, were very close to him. Amanda used to work for Marty because she paints very well. He didn't look down on me for, you know, I was trying to get my life back on track. And he told me, he, you know, he did it, so you can do it. Marty would bring a lot of these folks to family dinners or get-togethers. He tried to bring them into his family. But now, police want to know, had Marty's generosity and business exposed him to danger? He paid all of his people in cash. And that's just the way it is in the day labors with those guys. Uh, they, need, they need money that day, so they're going to work. And everything's cash. To know that he could pay them daily with cash and help them out may have led to his demise. Police also discover not all Marty's employees felt like part of the family. It wasn't an easy road for Marty because sometimes he would have to tell them that they couldn't work for him anymore because they would steal from him. Anytime you're working with people who have drug and alcohol problems, it's not uncommon for them to steal from their employers. And Marty had faced some of that. He wasn't afraid to stand up to these people. He would tell them, if you, you know, if you mess up, you're gone. So our list of suspects was a mile long. We were given several names, but yeah, it was so difficult for investigators because it was going to be hard to track them down. Where they were staying, they usually don't keep jobs very long. As detectives begin tracking down Marty's current and former employees, they ask his neighbor if anyone had a grudge against him. Well, I initially went to interview Amanda, and she said, you know, over the last month or so, there's been some rough-looking characters over there. One month before his death, he had been hanging out with these new people, and they were helping him work on his truck and then had to redo the job. She thought maybe there had been some anger issues between the victim and those guys. The day they were there working, Marty seemed to be pacing back and forth like they were taking too long and he didn't want to, you know, leave them at his house. They were making too big of a mess. He was upset about that. Amanda didn't know the men, but had overheard Marty talk to the man in charge. One was a guy named Junior, and so this was someone that we wanted to speak with. There's just one problem. We did not know who Junior was. We knew this to be probably a nickname, and that's all we really knew. While detectives plan to search for Junior, Amanda also provides them with the name of another one of Marty's former employees. Marty met Chris Dyer at Valero, the local convenience store that he went to nearly every morning to get a cup of coffee. 
Chris had recently been fired from that store, had a falling out with the owner, and Marty had employed him. I know Chris Dyer had worked for Marty, had been fired from there for drug use. He'd had a criminal past. He'd been arrested, had an addiction problem with drugs and alcohol. Officers speak with the owner of the Valero station where Chris once worked. The owner manager of the Valero store reaffirmed that Chris was just not a very good guy, that he had had trouble employing him. And so he felt like that he needed to let Chris go because there was always drama, that Chris was basically just at rock bottom and desperate for money. Chris Dyer knew that Marty carried several hundred dollars when he paid him for a job. He would pay him at the end of the day, and he would pay him with cash. Was Chris Dyer desperate enough to bludgeon Marty Lucas to death? We were thinking that maybe it was a robbery gone bad, knowing that Marty had this money in his home because he was down on his luck and needed money for drugs. And so there was a lot of questions concerning Chris Dyer. One of our main priorities early on in the investigation is to find this subject named Junior, along with Chris Dyer, and so we, we wanted to talk to these people. So we need to locate Junior, and we needed to talk to Chris as quickly as possible. Police investigating the murder of contractor Marty Lucas are chasing multiple leads as they search for his killer and stolen truck. They've set their sights on two of Marty's employees, an unidentified man called Junior, and a recently fired laborer named Chris Dyer. A lot of these folks who are going through tough times, there is nothing permanent in their lives. There is nothing fixed in their lives. There is no stability. And so it was hard to track them down. Following a lead, police questioned employees at the gas station where Chris had worked. I spoke with the clerk that was on duty at the Valero and she was able to give me a phone number to Gina Dyer. Gina is Chris's estranged wife. She and Chris had been separated about a month because she had caught him cheating, he had gone back to drug use, and that he was currently living at the Econo Lodge Hotel. Detectives find Chris at the hotel and bring him in for an interview. We really thought that we had something. We knew that Chris had easy access to Marty's home. Chris Dyer knew that Marty carried up to five to six hundred dollars in cash on him at, at any given point in time. So there's a rumor that um, some rumors went around that maybe you and him had gotten crossways and he had basically fired you. So you never had a disagreement? No, not at all. Nope. I'd like to know who in the hell's saying that because that's bullshit. <laughs> Pardon my French. Police know better than to trust Chris's word. We knew that Chris Dyer is down on his look and had run-ins with the law. And well, maybe this is our killer. This is who it is. And then you get him in an interview room and he's cooperative and he's genuine. In fact, he was very distraught over Marty's death. I hope he catch who the hell did it to fry their ass. Yeah, I know, right? But he was, man, that guy would do anything for anybody. He had some empathy there because he'd been in trouble before too. And damn sure, damn sure didn't deserve to go out like that. I think he considered Marty a friend, even though Marty had fired him. What should be calling for us to, to go through your truck, look through your truck, look through your hotel room, just yeah, see if there's yeah. anything that would be yeah, I got that we can roll you out. Marty had what we would consider defensive wounds to the hands. There was hair and blood under the fingernails of the body. And so we knew that there was some type of altercation. We knew that there had to be injuries on our suspect or suspects. And Chris had none of that. He had no recent cuts or bruises. In order to officially rule Chris out as a suspect, detectives check Chris's alibi. He said he had gone to Kingston, Oklahoma, which is nearby with Krista, his girlfriend. I believe it was the Wednesday before. Police bring Krista in for an interview. Is it possible that he slipped out of the room one night uh, while you were sleeping, left, did, went and did something? Uh, no. I have to say that it just could not be possible. His girlfriend also corroborated Chris's timeline as to what his story was. He had an alibi for that timeline, but he just didn't appear to be involved. With nothing to link Chris to the murder, police are forced to let him go. 
investigators hope Marty's preliminary autopsy report will provide more leads. The significant thing for us from the autopsy was the fact that the cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head, including the large gash to his head. Obviously, he was hit with something other than the rock because of the laceration on his head and because of the burn marks. These burns that was on his back and part of his right arm came back as a post-mortem burns, which was very interesting to us, which means that they were caused after Marty had passed away. Initially, we were looking at these burns to the body as being type of a torture. Now, we believe the iron was used as a secondary weapon after. So the suspect didn't realize that in his rage, he didn't know that Marty had already died and he continued to hit him with this iron. The preliminary autopsy report doesn't conclude whether the rock or iron ultimately killed Marty and an exact time of death remains undetermined. Meanwhile, with the killer still at large, the worry takes a toll on Marty's family. His son, Michael's always a quiet person, but he was like a walking zombie. I couldn't sleep at night. I'd stay up during the day. It's fear for my family. Uh, just because, like, I had no clue who would do this to my dad. Michael was really panicked. Marty had so many different men working with him. I was very fearful of my life. As police continue their search for other suspects, including the former employee, Junior, who worked on Marty's truck, a lead comes in about someone close to Marty who might have had a motive. One of Marty's friends had called one of our patrol officers and told him that Marty was dating a lady named Donna Hargrave. So Donna Hargrave is somebody that probably everybody at the Armour Police Department is familiar with and knows on site. We knew Donna had a drug problem as well. She did have a few run-ins with police and frequented a lot of the local casinos. Could Donna's vices have pushed her to murder Marty? She knew Marty and knew that he had large sums of cash and because she is a known drug user, that perhaps she had enlisted the assistance of another known drug user to go rob Marty. That was a scenario obviously had some possibility to it. That's why we needed to talk to Donna as quickly as possible. Officers bring Donna down to the police department for an interview. Upon bringing her into the interview room, she was handcuffed, and I knew that she had not come up there willingly. What's this about? Yes, if I'm not under arrest, then why do y'all have a reason to search me? She was really uncooperative. She did not want to speak to us. Okay, what is this about? Please speak so, to someone tell me what this is about. Okay, so... Somebody uh, who I've been hanging with. Yeah. Okay, who? Marty Lucas. that <laughs> Not straight up. She definitely has a problem with Marty that was very suspicious. And it really struck a nerve in us because we wanted to know what this problem is. Two days after finding the body of 63-year-old Marty Lucas, police are interviewing his former girlfriend, Donna Hargrave, a woman with a long criminal history and a grudge against Marty. She had been arrested many times here in Ardmore. She had been known to be at least uncooperative with police, if not somewhat violent and unruly. She didn't really care too much for Marty. We thought maybe she had something to do with his, with his death. Pissing off because he was just being a dickhead. So when you said him, what were you mad at him about? He just promised things and don't ever fall through. Like I talked to Marty about, about moving my trailer over to him. Over to his house or something, he said no. He knew that she had not been clean and that she had not been trying to straighten up and that he wasn't going to help her as long as she wasn't trying to help herself. Could Marty's rejection have led Donna to do something unthinkable? So if I were to tell you something bad happened to Marty, what would you say? What do you mean? What's wrong with him? Well, if I, if I were to tell you he was dead, someone did something to him, what would you say about that? Yeah. Where are you? 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 
Daddy. Yeah, that's that's why you're here. <laughs> this was a girl that was very hardened, and for her to break down and to cry, and was very genuinely upset over Marty's death. She did say that they had recently broken up and that she hadn't seen him any time in the last four, five, seven days. Can you kind of start like maybe Wednesday morning, tell me where you were, what you did, where you where you went? At my mom's and I slept all day. Okay. And we were able to pretty quickly corroborate where she had been. It was unlikely that she had anything to do with his death. However, we did not rule her out immediately. Days after Marty's gruesome death, his family and friends come together to say their goodbyes. Marty's funeral was amazing. It was very, very sad, though, because everyone who knew him knew that he didn't deserve anything ever bad to happen to him. Everyone loved Marty. Everyone. There was quite a bit of his workers, even his past workers, that come to his funeral. It was a good day, but a bad day at the same time. Meanwhile, police doggedly follow each and every lead. We did have a large suspect pool because we didn't know who all might have been working for Marty. One of the things that we wanted to get identified was who Junior was that was working on the truck. So myself and another investigator said, we'll run by the halfway houses and see if we can get Junior identified. So we went over to the Broadway house and the director there gave us the name of Clarence Bibb Junior. He said he thought Junior was from up by Oklahoma City, and he's got a pretty extensive record, including some assault. Well, we, we really believe that if Junior and Marty had gotten into an altercation over the payment of the truck motor, maybe he took the money, it got out of hand, he killed Marty, took Marty's money and the truck, and took it back to Oklahoma City to chop it up. We found that law enforcement there knew Clarence very well. They knew his family very well and they lived in several homes that would be described as a compound, like a family compound. And they said, don't go out there without a lot of us. Clarence is violent, and so you don't go up there by yourself. Detectives assemble a task force with local and state police and make the two-hour drive to Junior's compound. When I first got out there, I thought, man, this is a real possibility. Man, we might find our truck out here. So we went up and knocked on the door. And when Clarence showed up, I thought, good Lord, this is one large man. And if he gets violent, I don't know what I'm gonna do. <laughs> you look at him and you see what had happened to Marty, you're thinking that if anybody could do it, this guy could do it. I mean, he's big. Detectives ask if he and Marty had fallen out over the work Junior had done on Marty's truck. And he was happy with what Marty had paid him and there was no disagreement. He said, that Marty paid him $500 more than he was supposed to because of the trouble that we went through. And in fact, when I told him that Marty had died and that someone had caused his death, he too got emotional. Here, this big, mean, gruff country guy, and he's crying like a child over his friend's death. He said, you know, I wouldn't hurt Marty if somebody paid me to. He said he considered Marty a mentor and a friend. Clarence denied that he had been in Ardmore recently. He had gave an alibi that he had been at home with his mom and other family members around the time of Marty's death. And they corroborated his story that he was there. He fully cooperated with the investigation. He gave us his cell phone. He let us have clothing and boots. He let us search his house. He let us search the property. And I mean, he let us just have free reign of whatever we wanted. And we came up with nothing. I just remember thinking to myself, man, we are absolutely going nowhere with this investigation. With nothing to link Junior to the homicide, detectives begin to fear the investigation is cooling down. We had a pretty good idea that it wasn't Junior at that point. Donna Hargrave had a stone-clad alibi. Chris Dyer just didn't appear to be involved. I think both Bryce and I just were disheartened. We had no leads. We had no suspects, so we were just trying to figure out where do we go from here. Then, an unexpected call turns the case red hot. Well, we got back to the station and dispatch yells down to us, hey, they found your truck. We were dead tired, but you went from, you went from dead tired to wide awake in a hurry.
Four days into the investigation of Marty Lucas's murder, detectives get the break they were looking for, Marty's missing truck. And I remember the dispatcher telling me they found the truck. And I said, where is it? And they said, in Springdale, Arkansas. And so this was the break that we needed. We're pretty excited. And we're just about to go nuts. We're like, okay, get a hold of Springdale police. Get them on the phone. Let's find out what we got going on. It was a moment. I'll, I'll say that. Investigators ask Springdale police how Marty's truck had ended up over 300 miles away. A citizen had called and told them that his friend had been in possession of the truck. And his friend, he identified as Jack Latham. But who is Jack Latham? Detectives immediately ask Marty's family if they know the name. They learn Jack was one of Marty's most trusted laborers who hadn't been seen or heard from in months. Jack Latham, he worked for my dad for a long time. He was a really hard worker. Marty was extremely good to Jack. He gave him extra money here and there whenever he'd need it. Marty would bring him by my house sometimes, and they would occasionally ride around together. He seemed very quiet. It was not unusual for people to come and go in Marty's business. Jack Latham worked for him on and off a couple of years prior to this. When detectives dig into Jack's background, they learn he has a daughter and ex-wife in Ardmore and a checkered past. He had an extensive criminal history for drugs and theft, but he's not the guy I would have picked to have committed this crime. Jack Latham did minor misdemeanor type crimes, drug possession type crimes, but this is not a person that would even be on the radar because he had no really violent history. So you're not going to think that this is a guy who could kill somebody, particularly not in the manner in which Marty was killed. Investigators rush to Arkansas, where police have taken Jack into custody and seized the truck. But before speaking with Jack, they interview the man who first contacted police about the truck, Jack's friend, Raymond. Raymond, he says to us that out of the blue, Jack calls on Friday night and says that he has got court on Monday. Can he stay or the weekend? Raymond tells police Jack asked to get picked up at a local parking lot. So he goes to pick him up, and he sees he's sitting in a what looks like a pretty nice Chevy pickup. And he says, hey, you know, whose pickup is that? He said, oh, it's a guy that I'm visiting. He let me come sit in it to wait on you. And he says to us, I didn't believe him. Monday morning, Jack says, just take me to jail. I've got warrants. So he takes him to jail, and then he goes back home, and he looks to see what the warrants are for, and it's for theft. And he thinks, I wonder if that truck's stolen, because something doesn't feel right with that truck. So he goes back to where the parking lot where the truck is and sees it doesn't have tags on it. And so Raymond knew that Jack was lying. He knew he needed to call the police. We went and looked at the truck, and the truck looked pristine on the inside. But when we sprayed it with Blue Star, there was blood everywhere. We knew in the back of our minds that this was the key, that Jack Latham was the key to Marty Lucas's death. And then the investigation took off at warp speed because, yeah, we think we've got our guy. We went to the Benton County Jail and interviewed Jack that day. First thing I noticed about him is he's slight of build. He's not very big. He seems to be very reserved and meek. He doesn't seem to be what I would picture to be a killer. Then police noticed something else about Jack's appearance. He looked pretty bad. He had some injuries to his face. He had this greenish brown black eye or injury to his eye. He had some a minor abrasion to his lip. Could Jack have suffered his injuries while attacking his former boss, Marty? Police start by asking Jack when he was in Ardmore last. Okay, um, I guess at some point in time you've been in Ardmore, been around Ardmore, or lived in Ardmore or something. Yeah, a long time ago, about six years ago. Jack tells detectives he's recently been living 200 miles away in Enid, Oklahoma. Who were you staying with? Uh, my brother and him. Then, investigators cut to the chase. We've been working on an investigation for the last, uh, almost a week now. Your name's come up, and before I can really get into a lot of questions with you and details and explain to you, you know, why we're here and all that, um, I gotta read your Miranda rights. After we Mirandized him, he said he didn't want to talk to us anymore. Do you wish to make a statement, or will you answer any questions that we have for you today? No. No? Okay. With Jack refusing to talk, police need to find a way to place him near Marty's house at the time of the murder. So in his initial interview, he tells us that he hasn't been to Ardmore, that he came down here from his brother's house in Enid. 
I called Enid PD and they went out, they talked with the brother, they talked with the brother's wife. They said, yes, he has been here at our house. But then detectives get a stunning piece of information Jack hadn't shared. His brother's wife said, I'd put him on the bus to go see his wife and daughter in Ardmore on the Monday morning before Marty had been killed. So we knew he had gotten to Ardmore. We, the next day we got a hold of the bus and found out that yes, indeed, he had been at Ardmore. With Jack still in custody, police drive back to Ardmore. The detectives got a search warrant and looked through Jack's phone and that led them to his ex-wife and daughter. Did you see your dad in the truck mm-hmm. last week? Yeah. Okay. Do you understand what kind of trouble your dad's possibly in? He's been detained as a suspect in a homicide. Mm-hmm. So you for sure haven't seen your dad since he's been in Arkansas. Yeah. Investigators talk to Jack's ex-wife, Teresa, next. Has he came to visit you lately? No? I haven't seen from him or heard from him. So would it surprise you to know that Jack is involved in a homicide here in Ardmore? Yeah, because it doesn't seem like him. Both of them said they haven't seen Jack in Ben and Ardmore. They don't know what we're talking about. And we knew this was not true because on Jack's phone, we knew that he had called. Teresa and Shelby. And during that interview with Teresa, I laid it out for her. I just flat out told her I knew she was lying. I'm not saying anything. I've told you guys everything I know. No, you haven't. Yes, sir, I have. No, you haven't. And we can prove it. It's a matter of time before we put you in that truck. We put you in that truck, it, it starts getting serious in a real quick hurry. Police start to question if Jack's ex-wife and daughter are involved in Marty's murder. At that point, she decided that she didn't want to talk to us anymore, and she and Shelby left, and I just told her, we're not gonna stop. We're gonna solve this crime with or without you. The only question is, where's your role gonna be? Less than 24 hours later, police get a call. The next day, early morning, the next morning, Teresa called, said, I wanna come back and talk. So from that, I mean, that, that kind of broke open a whole new layer of the case. investigating the murder of Marty Lucas are trying to place his friend and employee, Jack Latham, at the scene of the crime. We knew that he was coming here to visit his wife and daughter. They both told investigators that they did not know where Jack was. They had not seen Jack. He had not been in Ardmore. But Jack's daughter and ex-wife returned to the police station the next day. Yesterday, you were pretty far that you didn't know nothing. I was really scared and I thought about it all night and I felt really bad. Really hit home, so I had to tell the truth. I did see Jack on the 11th and 12th. Which was what, Monday and Tuesday? Monday and Tuesday. Okay. And he dropped us off at my mom's house on the 13th in the morning. Teresa says Jack stayed at an Ardmore motel on Monday and Tuesday nights. They said Jack had called Marty to see if he had any work for him. And Marty said, no, I I can't use you. I don't need you right now. And do you know what day that was? They both said that about 8 or 8.30 on that Wednesday morning, Jack left, sent an officer to Motel 6 to see if they had video. And sure enough, we've got video of Jack Latham leaving Motel 6, wearing the same clothes as the person that's walking. The Bolero camera picks up. About an hour later, a green Chevrolet truck that we believe was Marty's truck shows up in the parking lot in Motel 6. You watch him go over to a dumpster, throw something in the dumpster, which we believe was the rock and the iron. Where did he go get the truck? He said he couldn't get it to him. Then Jack did something even more suspicious. When he came in, he went straight to the sink and washed his hands. He, uh, he did wipe his face down and he put his hoodie on and he told me that he did something bad, but he wouldn't tell me what. He said, we gotta leave, we gotta get out of here. He drops them off and they don't see him again. And so by then, yeah, we got enough to file charges on Jack Lee. I called the family members and told them what we knew. I was very shocked because Jack had been in my house around my children. He just acted very shy, but he didn't act like he would hurt anyone. 
It was shocking to me because he treated Jack with respect like he did everyone else. Police charge Jack Latham with first degree murder and extradite him from Arkansas. When he arrives in Ardmore, Jack starts talking. Jack told me that he was in desperate need of money, that he had no job, that he needed money for drugs. And he knew that Marty Lucas was the source of that money. Marty had told him no, that he knew that he wasn't clean. His story was that a physical altercation occurred, that he took a rock paperweight from the kitchen table, struck Marty with it, that, in his words, he freaked out, took the keys to the truck and a few hundred dollars from the wallet and left the area. Jack denies attacking Marty with a stone from outside or the iron. There were some aspects where he seemed to truly be confused about what had happened because he was strung out on drugs, including was there an iron used? So what had really happened? Police have their own theory as to how the murder played out. We believe that this was premeditated. I think he went to Marty's house, and I think he picked that rock up on the outside of the house and he knocked on the door, because I don't think he was going to take no for an answer. And when Marty told him no, a fight ensued in which he struck Marty with the rock. Uh, I think Marty fought back. He struck him with the iron, which was readily available, and then burned him with it, whether on purpose or on accident. He took the iron and he took the rock with him, and he disposed of the evidence, and he drove to Arkansas. It was absolutely senseless over a few hundred dollars. Despite the evidence, prosecutors worry defense lawyers will try to argue Jack was desperate and never planned to kill Marty. I thought that this case met the elements from a legal standpoint of first-degree murder, but then you have to be mindful of the fact that a jury would think also Jack's explanation is somewhat believable. He's a hopeless junkie. He's desperate for money. With the family's consent, prosecutors charged Jack with second-degree murder. We didn't want to risk going to trial and then letting him free. In October 2020, Jack Latham pleads guilty and is sentenced to 25 years in prison. I feel like we got justice. I know he's going to be locked up and my family's going to be safe. Jack was very unexpected as a killer because he just didn't act like he was that type of person. Jack Latham, he's, he's still a mystery to me, you know, because just by being around him, I never thought he would do something like that. He did this for nothing. There was no reason for nothing. Marty was such a nice guy. But not only that, I mean, think of all the people whose lives he affected in a positive way. That's a sense of loss for our community. When I lost Marty, I lost my life, too. He was the most amazing person I could ever. Sorry. Despite Marty's horrific death, the legacy of his compassion lives on. My dad, he'd be very proud of the lives that he's changed in the community. It made me appreciate everything about Marty and the second chances he gave to everybody because it made me feel like I should give people second chances. A trailblazing local businesswoman beloved by her community. She was effervescent. She just had a glamour about her that was just unique. She took pride in who she was. Savagely murdered in her own home. This person was so enraged that they just kept stabbing and kept stabbing and kept stabbing. She had been hit in the head to the point that it actually had changed shape. We're looking for something that's got an edge on it, but that can snap bones. Detectives uncover a trail of secrets and lies. He couldn't explain things, and he failed the polygraph miserably. What kind of animal is this person? And chase a killer that stays one step ahead of them. They flip to a, another country. Until a series of stunning revelations leaves an entire town in shock. Everyone was a suspect, and everyone was afraid. Here comes some guy out of the blue telling us that he's the one who committed the murder. You would think there's just a serial killer or somebody crazy running around. 
I was like, how could we have gotten this wrong? southwest of Louisville, Kentucky, lies the quiet town of Madisonville. Madisonville, Kentucky is a small community. It's built on coal mines and agriculture. It's a close, tight-knit community. There's not a lot of crime in our area. They call themselves the best town on earth, and for the most part, they truly believe that. On January 13th, 2003, Madisonville police receive a call from an elderly man for a wellness check on his 85-year-old fiance, Anna Mae Branson. Her fiance, Dr. Bob Benjamin, was afraid that she may have fallen or that she had had a stroke of some type. He knocked on the door and couldn't get her to answer. And that's when he became worried. And he called Anna Mae's brother and the local police department. An officer meets Anne's fiance and brother outside her house, finding a backup key under a bush. They enter the home to look for her. The patrol officer went in one direction. Dr. Bob Fenneman was looking around, and Earl Winstead, her brother, went down to the basement. When he got to the bottom of the basement steps, he said, I found her. It appeared as first though she could have fallen. But then upon seeing all the injuries to her body, it was obvious that Miss Branson had been murdered. Homicide investigators are called to the scene and are shocked when they arrive. Miss Ann was a friend of my mother's and it was quite devastating. She was on her stomach. Her legs were extended. She had many, many stab wounds to her back. She had been hit in the head to the point that it actually had changed shape. Looking at the body, detectives start building a theory of what happened. She had defensive wounds on her forearms, then she was knocked down. That's when the perpetrator really went to work. Her head was facing the small chest type freezer. There was actually two types of blood spatter on the freezer next to her head. One was like a striking motion, and one was a golf-type swing, where the spin-off from the blood spatter actually landed on that. I can remember thinking that the perpetrator must have used two different weapons. The weapon was not only going through flesh and organs, going through bones, and was coming out on the floor underneath her. It was unlike anything that we'd ever seen or heard of before. Why was this defenseless woman attacked so viciously? Detectives continue their search for evidence. At the time, we didn't see anything stolen. All of her large carrot jewelry were on her finger and had not been touched. The amount of damage she sustained suggests that uh, the attacker was mostly attached to her. You think about someone leaving the area, dripping blood from you know their arms and not to find any blood on the door frames, handrails. It was surmisable that the person had taken the time to clean up the crime scene. But other than the evidence on the freezer and the amount of damage that she had sustained, there was no other real clues. News of Ann's death spreads quickly in the small town. I got the call that Ann had been murdered, and not just murdered, but unbelievably brutally murdered. It's just something that you see on the news, but it's not real until it happens in your family. I just felt like a ton of bricks had fallen on me. Having someone who was a second mother to me killed in such a horrible way is just overwhelmingly devastating. Anna Mae Winstead was born in Madisonville on November 30th, 1917. And from the beginning, she stood out from the crowd. Anne was effervescent. She just had a confidence about her, a glamour about her that was just unique. 
Anna Mae was a very flamboyant lady. She had a zest for life. In 1935, Anne married her high school sweetheart, Carol Branson. When Anna Mae and Carol were first married, they were poor. During World War II, Anna Mae was a Rosie the Riveter, working on fighter planes. But that was just the start for her. After that, she liked business, and she stayed in the business world. In 1950, the hardworking couple used their savings to buy a Dairy Queen franchise. The center of the town was the Dairy Queen, and everyone went there for date night. Miss Ann, as a boss, was a demanding person, but she also made you feel like you were part of the family there. They literally became multimillionaires through this Dairy Queen. When Ann's husband, Carol, died in 1994, Ann was ready to take on a new business challenge. She would get these older houses, and then she would make them fabulous, and then she would rent them. Anna Mae was one of the most successful business people that I've ever known, even in her older age. Anne was generous with her renters, and she was generous with her family. And everyone knew that they could borrow money from Anne, but they would have to pay it back. Anna Mae was so much of a businesswoman that she kept a ledger with information about people that owed her money. In her later years, family and business weren't the only things in Anne's life. Several months before her death, Anne had met retired eye surgeon, Dr. Bob Fenneman. Dr. Bob lived in Evansville, Indiana, about 50 miles from Madisonville. When she and Dr. Bob first started dating, she said, well, I've got a boyfriend. The very last thing that Anna Mae acted like was an old lady. When I found out that she was murdered, that just totally, totally shocked me. At the crime scene, detectives examined the rest of the house for clues. There were no signs of forced entry into her residence. Nothing was ransacked, like somebody was searching for something. We didn't have any idea who would commit such a violent act on an 85-year-old woman. What kind of animal is this person? While forensics continue their work, detectives speak to the two men who alerted police, her fiance, Bob, and her brother, Earl. Earl was asked to establish a timeline for that Sunday, and he had provided an alibi where he was with family at the time of the murder, and the family did substantiate his whereabouts. What about Ant's fiance? Could he have had a reason to harm her? A homicide of this magnitude you need to ask who's in a relationship with this victim. When we interviewed uh, Dr. Bob Fenneman, he was emotionally distraught. Dr. Bob did ask Anne to marry him. She did accept his three-carat diamond ring, but she had not set a date. They had talked about whether they would have some sort of agreement because she did have a lot of money, but she was kind of hesitant. Police want to know, had Ann's hesitancy about Bob caused him to turn against her in a violent rage? This person was so enraged that they just kept stabbing and kept stabbing and kept stabbing to inflict that many injuries. This was a personal crime. Coming up, buried secrets are brought to light. We all thought he was a family man, thought he was a churchgoer. She explained that her alibi had been coerced. While detectives unearthed suspects with violent pasts. He had several assaults in his past. We're starting to think, hey, you know, this could be our guy. They had already stabbed another woman. We would never have dreamed who the killer was. Detectives are investigating the horrific murder of elderly millionaire Ann Branson. Forensics suggests it was a crime of passion. Dr. Bob, even with his age, we did feel could be a viable suspect. 
Dr. Bob was from Evansville, and he drove all the time to Madisonville to court Anne. But she had not yet decided whether she was going to get married. Had Anne's reluctance turned Bob against her? Dr. Bob Fenneman was asked to establish a timeline and provide us with an alibi. The day before Miss Branson was murdered, she had gone to Evansville, Indiana, to meet up with Dr. Fenneman to go to a dance. And after the dance, Miss Branson returned to Madisonville. Sunday, he said he attempted to call her and she didn't answer the phone. It was shortly before 10 o'clock that evening and Dr. Fenneman said that he presumed that she had gone out or that she had gone to bed early. So the next day he said he became worried and he said that's when they discovered the body at the bottom of the staircase. Detectives learned from speaking to her family that Anne had been to an evening church service on Sunday. Miss Branson's estimated time of death was on that Sunday evening after she returned home from church. Dr. Bob said that he was at home in Evansville, Indiana. Taking no chances, investigators search his phone records. Phone calls placed Dr. Bob in Evansville, Indiana, so he would not have been in the area during the time frame of the murder. He did not have the opportunity to murder her. It just wasn't feasible for him to have committed the crime. After clearing Bob as a suspect, they ask if he can think of anyone who would harm his fiance. Dr. Bob recalled that her handyman, Wayne Shelton, had borrowed money from Miss Anna in the past, and the amount was more than what a handyman should be borrowing from his employer. Mr. Shelton also owed child support. He was trying to provide the court system a statement that she would guarantee his employment, and Miss Branson did not feel that she could guarantee him employment. So she had concerns over it. The fact that the maintenance man had a financial relationship with the victim made him a person of interest that we wanted to talk to. Detectives contact Wayne Shelton and ask him to meet them at Ann's house. Wayne Shelton came to the crime scene when we were there and I explained to him the circumstances of what had occurred. He was extremely shaken. He was in disbelief. Police cut to the chase and ask Wayne where he was on the night Ann was murdered. His alibi was he was in another county visiting with his daughter during the murder of Ann Branson. Knowing Wayne's alibi is weak, detectives take him to the station for a polygraph. But there's just one problem. Wayne Shelton had a heart condition. It was so fragile that it kept him from even being able to take a polygraph. So the polygraph examiner refused to give Mr. Shelton a polygraph. Frustrated by this setback, Ann's nephew, Jack Branson, a retired FBI officer, pulls some strings. Mary and I hired a retired FBI polygrapher. And Wayne Shelton said, yes, I'll be polygraphed. Jack's polygrapher takes Wayne Shelton carefully through the test questions. Wayne Shelton passed the polygraph with flying colors. So at that point, we were able to say, OK, he passed the polygraph. He did not do it. As investigators search for new suspects, news of the savage murder puts the whole town on edge. This had been a little town where literally people didn't lock their doors. And all of a sudden, everyone was a suspect and everyone was afraid. The community needed to know if they had something to fear. So it was pressure all the way around to get this crime solved. As word spreads, police begin to receive tips from the public. We've received a tip that there was a black pickup truck at the residence after 12 at night. Could the black truck belong to the killer? 
Investigators ask Ann's family if they know anyone who drives such a vehicle. We kept hearing about a, a crazy tenant that drove a black truck. What detectives learn about Ann's tenant concerns them. Robert Prince had characteristics of a mentally unstable person. He would actually call her in the middle of the night and say that he had ghosts up in his attic. And would she please get rid of the ghosts? Ann always said she was nervous around him, and she didn't like it when he came to the house. And he called her at all hours of the day and night. Miss Branson had received several complaints from the neighbors asking that she evict Mr. Prince from his apartment. And she did want to move him from that location. The family would say, don't become so involved with him. Had Ann's attempt to move Robert prompted him to attack her? If Robert Prince was mentally unstable and became angry at her, could he have caused her death? Detectives investigating the slaughter of Ann Branson have discovered she had been involved in a dispute with a volatile tenant. Robert Prince would call Mrs. Branson at all hours, saying crazy things to her, wanting her to come over. They had warned her not to go over there by herself. Due to his mental instability, he did pose a great concern for us to investigate. Searching their database, detectives find alarming information about their new suspect. Robert Prince was found to have had a violent criminal history. He had several assaults in his past, and he could express a lot of anger towards someone else. Police obtain a warrant to search his home. What we were looking for is the murder weapon. I'm looking for something that's got an edge on it, but that could snap bones and go completely through the victim's body. And I'm looking for any clothes. There's no way that the perpetrator did this without getting some of the blood on himself but we weren't able to locate any of the items that would be of interest to us in this case. Despite the lack of physical evidence, detectives bring Robert Prince into the station for questioning. When he was taken from his residence and interrogated, he did not want to answer any questions to do with his prior criminal history. And upon initial confrontation with Robert Prince, he was extremely agitated. As he starts talking, we're picking up on his violent tendencies. We're starting to think, hey, you know, this could be our guy. Detectives note that Robert's right arm is injured. Even though he's a man that could inflict this kind of punishment, he can't bend his right arm. And we ask him, so you right-handed or left-handed? He said, I'm right-handed. Detectives wonder, could Robert have hurt his arm attacking Ann? He said he was in another state at the estimated time of death for Ms. Branson. Robert Prince gave the alibi that he was with some family in Tennessee and that he had stopped in a convenience store and got some gas and got a sold or something. With nothing concrete linking Robert to the homicide, police have to let him go and detectives get to work checking his alibi. We contact that convenience store, pull surveillance video, and lo and behold, there's Robert Prince on camera. And in addition to that, prior to Ms. Branson's murder, Robert Prince had surgery to his elbow area and his arm. And according to his doctor, if he had inflicted those injuries upon Ms. Branson, then all of his staples and his stitches in his arm would no longer be intact. So the alibi and surgical area just ruled him out as a suspect. Back at square one, Detectives are relying on the autopsy to break open new leads. The autopsy revealed that Mrs. Branson was stabbed about 97 times throughout her body. Her skull was pulverized. She was beaten so badly that a lot of the stab wounds were actually inflicted after she had passed away. The evidence technician said that we're not talking about just a regular old steak knife. That's something that's very heavy. 
because the blade is going through her bones, through her organs, and was coming out on the other side. While the autopsy fails to identify an actual murder weapon, it gives a clear estimate of Anne's time of death. There was a pot on the stove. Which she had baked her supper. She had eaten. We were able to analyze the food in her stomach. And based on the absorption rate principle, the time of death for her was approximately 30 minutes after she got home from church. It was determined that her time of death was between 7 and 7.30 p.m. As police continue their search for the killer, Ann's family struggles with her death. Mary and I walked over to Earl's house to see how he was dealing with the grief. And his son, Russell, took us in to see Earl. The whole family was in shock, and everyone was just questioning who could have possibly done this. Earl and Russell, they were both saying, we'll be glad when we found out who did this. And we understood that was exactly how we were feeling. As the family grieves, Madisonville residents question whether their town really is the best town on earth. When the town found out that Miss Branson had been murdered, it scared a lot of people because you would think there's just a serial killer or somebody crazy running around to have done that. This is Madisonville, Kentucky, coined best town on earth. You cannot have an unsolved murder of one of its most prominent members. It just it can't happen. As detectives contemplate their next move, an unexpected tip sends the case in a new direction. We're day four or five into this investigation, but we have nothing strong yet. And then we get a phone call. That was the pivotal turning point. The caller is a local mine worker named Jeff Hibbs. Jeff Hibbs has some information about one of Anna Mae's nephews, Russell Winstead. That phone call basically shocked and rocked our investigation. Five days after the bloody murder of 85-year-old Ann Branson, police are contacted by a man named Jeff Hibbs, who makes a stunning allegation. Jeff Hibbs believed that Russell Winston had some involvement with the murder of his aunt, Anna Mae Branson. Russell Winstead was known as a coal miner, a hard worker. He had three sons. He was married to Terry Winstead. It was known that he and his family attended church regularly. Jeff claims that Russell has a secret unknown to his family. Jeff Hibbs told us that Russell Winstead had an extreme gambling addiction. He also tells detectives that he'd gone gambling with Russell a few nights before Ann's murder. Russell told Jeff he had gotten a loan from his aunt that he had to repay by Monday morning, and that he had $9,700, and he lost every single penny of that money. Russell told Jeff that they're all going to know about his gambling addiction because his aunt is going to expose him for borrowing money from her on a regular basis and uh, not paying it back. Jeff tells police that on Monday, the local headlines grabbed his attention. Jeff Hibbs reads about this old lady that got murdered in Madisonville. And he was like, oh my gosh, this is the aunt that Russell had to repay by the first of the week. Detectives go back to Ann's house to search for evidence. On our second search, I found a ledger and the large amount of loans that was written down for one nephew. They totaled up almost $100,000. The day before her murder, she had actually written down that he had received $9,700 from her and that he had paid her a check for $12,000. Detectives believe that Russell had given Ann a check in hopes of winning enough at the casino to cover it. But when the check is nowhere to be found, detectives subpoena his bank records. Upon the financial investigation, it was determined that 
Russell was basically shifting money around to cover the loans from his aunt. And the missing check for the $12,000 never cleared the bank. Ten days after the homicide, detectives interview Russell Winstead. Even when we told him that Miss Branson had put it in her ledger, Russell still denied any knowledge of that check. He denied having any involvement in this whatsoever. At the time of death, Russell explained that he had gone to church and that upon leaving church, he had dropped his children off at his ex-wife's house and then that he was at home in the basement. Russell said he got home about 7.25 p.m. With Ann's time of death estimated between 7 and 7.30 p.m., detectives interview Russell's wife, Terry, to verify his alibi. Terry's explanation for Russell was down to the minute. She said, yeah, we went to church. We drove separate. He dropped his son off at his ex-wife's house, and then he got home, 7.25. Russell had a solid alibi. His wife told the exact same story he did as to where Russell was on the night of Mrs. Branson's death. There's just one loose end for detectives to tie up, Russell's casino visits. I asked, you know Russell gambles, right? And she's like, yeah, I know he gambles. I was like, on a bad night, what do you think he loses? And she's like, I don't know, two or 3,000. I was like, try 38,000 on one night. And she started bawling. This was just devastating to her because she trusted Russell. That same day, police get a search warrant for Russell's home. We didn't find the murder weapon. We didn't find any clothes that uh, they were bloodstained. But we did recover a couple of burner cell phones that his wife didn't know even existed. One of the cell phones was only used to contact a waitress at one of the casinos. Russell had a girlfriend who worked at the casino. So we talked to the waitress, and it alarmed us somewhat that even after he's a suspect of interest in a murder case, Russell was still continuing to go to the casino, still trying to be uh, the high roller. Russell has plenty of secrets, but do money problems and infidelity make him a killer? Russell's father, Earl, told me the police are trying to jam Russell up because they need a suspect and they want to solve this case. When we found out that Russell had been living a literal double life, we were shocked, but we felt that there was no way Russell had not done this. We believed it with all of our but as they dig deeper into Russell's gambling, detectives find evidence of a man out of control. We come with a total of 236 times that Russell had visited a casino in the last year, losing hundreds of thousands of dollars in that time frame. When it's rolled up into one, you're just like going, who is this guy? The scope of Russell's betrayal prompts his wife, Terry, to kick him out of the house and return to police with a damning admission. Terry explained that her alibi had been coerced. She said that Russell is the one that told her what to say. She explained that Russell actually did not come home around 7.30 p.m., that it was more like nine, so that put him as being a person that could have committed this murder. Investigators obtain a warrant for Russell's arrest, but when they go to bring him in, they're in for a shock. Russell Winstead had fled the country. We were very concerned that he would not be brought to justice. When I found out that if Russell Winstead had fled it was my goal to get him, no matter what the cost, manpower, what it took.
the prime suspect in the murder of Ann Branson is her nephew, Russell Winstead. But before investigators can make an arrest, Russell goes on the run. For Russell to have fled the country, it was shocking to all of us. An innocent man doesn't flee like that. This is the last straw and he has to come back. I have never been a person that takes waiting very well. And our son came up with the idea of putting this case on America's Most Wanted. If you've seen Russell Winstead, please call our hotline tonight at 1-800-CRIME-TV. They aired the show February of 05, and then in May of 05, Russell was spotted at a casino in Costa Rica. He was living under a pseudonym. He was still bouncing from female to female, and he was living the lifestyle that he attempted to live here. We knew where he was. We wanted justice. There's just one problem. With Russell facing a potential death sentence at home, Costa Rican authorities refuse to hand him over. Costa Rica will not extradite anyone to the United States where the death sentence is a possibility. And also, they have gambling. So Russell had done his homework big time. While investigators strategize how to get Russell back to Kentucky, they make a troubling discovery. We found out that Russell's father, Earl, had been providing Russell with monies for his lifestyle in Costa Rica. We had a guy come forward that said that Earl was actually paying him to wire money via Western Union to Russell in Costa Rica. We believed Earl was actually uh, aiding and abetting uh, Russell's flight. With Earl sending his son proceeds from the estate of the person he murdered, it basically rubbed salt in the wound. It turned your stomach. Investigators set up a sting to catch Earl red-handed. So we wired this guy up as a confidential informant and he met Earl, wired the money, and we got Earl doing that two or three times. It was verified that Earl was sending money to Russell in Costa Rica. While investigators find no evidence that Earl was involved in his sister Ann's murder, they arrest him for helping his son evade justice. It really struck all of us by surprise. The thought that Russell Winstead's father, Earl Winstead, was sending money down to live on in Costa Rica just sat like a burr under a saddle with me. I remember Earl being led out in handcuffs because he was arrested for helping a fugitive. But what really hurt us deeply was the fact that we knew it was Anne's money that was paying for her murderer. Earl eventually pleads guilty to seven counts of hindering apprehension. He was placed on probation for two years, and if he contacted Russell at any point during those two years, then he would have to serve jail time. While Earl faces legal trouble at home, federal authorities move in on Russell in Costa Rica. Russell was observed at the gambling casinos. They felt that that was probably the safest place for them to take him into custody. So as Russell was leaving the gambling casino in Costa Rica, he was apprehended. He was arrested in May of 2005 in Costa Rica. We did not get him back to Kentucky until February of the following year. Extraditing someone back from an, another country takes a, a lot of time, and federal authorities had to make assurances that we would not seek the death penalty against Russell. It took us seven months to extradite him back to the United States. To know that, that it was taking this long was very hard. In fact, every time we'd visit a cemetery where I was buried, I say, we're gonna get him. We're gonna get him. That was a long slow. 
long, slow process. Finally, more than three years after Anne's murder, Russell Winstead is returned home to face trial for the murder of his aunt. That day, I'll never forget, I went back to Anna May's grave and said, we got him. And I felt like a burden had been lifted because we knew what justice was going to be done. Upon Russell's return to Kentucky, we were preparing for a trial. When we got another humongous bombshell, as far as our investigation is concerned. Someone who was also charged with murder of an elderly lady came forward saying that he was the one who had killed Mrs. Branson. All of this evidence has been stacking up against Russell Winstead. And here comes some guy out of the blue telling us that he's the one who committed the murder. The confession is contained in a letter posted from Hopkins County Jail by an accused murderer named Fred Roulette. Fred Roulette basically gives detailed information on the murder of Ann Branson. That was never publicly made known. He stated that the murder weapon was a Braddis hammer. It is a mining tool, and he advised that he had modified that. Fred Roulette provided a drawing of Mrs. Branson's home, and it was eerily accurate. He gives all of these details that only the killer would know. I was like, how could we have gotten this wrong? Police have arrested Russell Winstead for the brutal murder of his aunt, Ann Branson. But now accused murderer Fred Roulette has confessed to the crime, leaving investigators reeling. Fred Roulette was also charged with murdering an elderly lady. So you think, oh my gosh, did we get it wrong? It was completely devastating. So we were determined we were gonna find out the circumstances of his confession. Investigators throw all their resources into checking the validity of Fred's confession. Fred was a drug addict and he could not provide the details of the murder and robbery that he himself had committed to the level of detail that he provided about Mrs. Branson's case. When investigators check the jail records, they discover a telling detail. Fred did not come forward until after Russell had been extradited back to Kentucky and Fred Roulette and Russell Winstead were cellmates. Already facing 25 years on a separate murder charge, Fred Roulette insists to detectives that he killed Ann Branson. Fred didn't realize until we told him that if he wanted to confess to this murder, it now packed a death penalty. After Fred heard those words, he was like, oh, no, game's off, gig's up. That's when he told investigators that he had all the intimate details of the murder from Russell Winstead. Fred Roulette was promised that his family would receive compensation since he was going to be in prison for the additional murder. So Fred Roulette agreed to take the false confession. With Russell's deception exposed, his trial can proceed. In July 2007, four years after Ann's murder, a jury hears what really happened on that Sunday night in January 2003. Mrs. Branson had loaned Russell upwards of $100,000. And Mrs. Branson notated in that ledger was that she had received that $12,000 check from Russell on Saturday. As partial repayment of the loan, Russell had a large sum of money that he lost in the casino. And he made mention that 
he needed to pay back to his aunt on Monday. Russell knew he could not make good on that $12,000 check. I believe that Russell Winstead was so desperate that he went over and he attempted to talk Miss Ann into tearing up the $12,000 check. When that didn't work, I believe that he lost it and that he snapped. And that's when she started receiving all the damage to the 65 plus stab wounds to her back. We still do not know to this day how many times Anna Mae Branson was hit in the head. He cleaned up the crime scene and he felt that he could get away with murder. Russell Winstead is convicted of murder and first degree robbery. He is sentenced to life with the possibility of parole after 25 years. We all thought he was a family man, thought he was a churchgoer, but he was leading a secret life when he was off work, gambling. Hid it from the family, hid it from his wife. We would never have dreamed who the killer was. Of all the people that we could have looked around in a crowded room and said, that's the person. It would not have been the person that ended up being the killer. When they announced the verdict, relief washed over me like Niagara Falls, a relief that this jury saw through Russell Winstead and he did not fool them. Finally, Miss Ann got her justice and everybody who loved and knew her got a form of justice. I miss Ann every day. And finally, I can think of her without thinking of her murder. I can finally think of her for who she was. Beautiful, beautiful part of our family. Yeah, and I took pride in who she was. I think she'd be happy to be remembered as someone who enjoyed life and had a good one. A young woman with a big heart. She was the most compassionate, caring, captivating person I've ever met. She was in a very good place in her life. Murdered in a terrifying attack. Somebody set the body on fire and left. Her last few minutes of life was pure hell. Detectives discover a secret affair. They had started to develop more of a relationship. We told him straight up, you're the killer, and we're going to have your DNA. Then uncover a surprising suspect hunting for prey. The night that she was murdered, she had answered a call. There was a note of directions were to a fictitious place. He was trying to trick young women. A second tragedy sparks terror in the community. We may be dealing with a serial killer. I lived in fear. I was terrified to go out at night. Before a calculating killer is ultimately revealed. This is not real. This can't be happening. This is crazy. Just 90 minutes from the bright lights of Nashville, Tullahoma, Tennessee is a quaint city full of Southern charm. Tullahoma is a very small town. Everybody knows everybody. Your teachers at the high school are the same teachers that taught your grandparents. The community is very close-knit. The people there are genuine. It's a safe place to live. We don't have a lot of violent, violent crime. In the early morning of July 2nd, 2012, a grisly crime is discovered that sets the whole town on edge. I got the call that a couple of younger people were driving down a very, very rural road and they seen a fire. They were gonna put the fire out, but when they went over there, 
they noticed that it was a body that was on fire and called 911. When I arrived at the scene, several other investigators were there and said, uh, this is real bad. It appeared that foul play was involved. We weren't sure that she was murdered at this spot. It appeared that somebody may have just pulled over or backed up, dumped the body, set the body on fire, and left. There were some tire tracks. We couldn't plaster cast them because they were in gravel. I just kind of surveyed what we had. There was no evidentiary value. Where do we go from here? First responders extinguish the fire, and investigators take a closer look at the scene. As we worked our way closer to the body, you started to get a sense of, you know, how horrible this actually was. It's just like something you would see off of a movie. This is not real. This can't be happening. This is crazy. The victim was a young white female, possibly in her 20s. There was star tattoos behind each one of her ears. And there was a magnolia leaf tattoo. I remember she had a shirt on. It had something to do with the nurse in technical school. She was undressed from the waist down. Body was partially burned and covered in soot. The fire was relegated to her pelvic area. It led us to believe that there had been a sexual assault. Someone had obviously tried to burn the evidence up. Her body was already in rigor. I would believe that she was deceased at the time of the fire. What? was very glaring was blunt force trauma to her head. You could actually feel the broken bones in the skull. Detectives immediately attempt to identify the young victim. There was no purse, no cell phone, no license, no vehicle to help us identify who the victim was. Investigators speak to the couple who made the 911 call. They didn't know who the person was. They didn't see or hear anyone. It was obvious almost immediately. They didn't have anything to do with this homicide. It was very traumatic for them. They just couldn't believe it. At the scene, I made the suggestion to put what information we had on social media to help us identify her. Within a few short hours, local mother of four, Kelly Sharpton, sees the missing persons report posted online. Mom was at work, and there was a post about a young girl that had been found when she came across the section that said she had star tattoos. I was told that mom screamed out in the middle of her office. And then, of course, she called the sheriff's office. She introduced herself, and we started talking, and, and the description Seemed similar, the tattoos seemed to match. Kelly instantly heads down to the police station for a formal interview. When we interviewed Kelly, she was distraught. She was crying, and she identified the body in Todd's office on pictures. The victim was her daughter, Megan Sharpton. I walked in and I immediately heard my mom sobbing. And I can still hear her to this day. She just said, somebody killed her last night. And it took me a second to figure out what she had just said. And then it hit me that she was gone. 24-year-old Megan Sharpton was a bright young woman with a big heart. She was genuine. She was the most compassionate, caring, captivating person I've ever met. She and I were really, really, really close. She had the best laugh. She was so fun. I could count on Megan to do anything for me. I knew she was always there. She was absolutely hilarious, very bold, and but at the same time, you could tell she didn't want to be the center of attention. Regardless of who you were, where you were from, she didn't care. She really, truly cared for every single person. Megan had decided to turn her caring nature into a career. She was working herself, you know, through nursing school. Megan would have been an amazing nurse. 
she had her head on straight and was, you know, ready to get going with her career. Along with her calling, Megan had also found love. She lived with her boyfriend, Chris. They were together three to four years. They had the same, you know, group of friends. She was in a very good place in her life. She had lots of goals to go on to those next levels in school, in her career. Megan was about two months away from graduation. She was very excited about it. Never in a million years did I think that somebody would kill her. Investigators start piecing together a timeline of Megan's last known movements. I spoke to her that Sunday afternoon. It was about four or five. We would go to mom's on Sunday and visit and have dinner and just kind of hang out as a family. But that Sunday was different. Megan said she would be skipping dinner as she had a last minute job interview. She said that she would head to mom's at some point. But Megan never showed up. Later on that night, she wasn't there. It wasn't a concern for us. We all thought, OK, well, something else must have come up. She was on her own time, and we'll see her sometime tomorrow. Tragically, it would only be a matter of hours before Megan is discovered dead and on fire. I was very much in shock that day. It didn't sink in that somebody killed her. It was just very, very hard to process. In the interview, Carrie and Megan's mom told us what kind of car she drives. We put a bolo out for that car. When investigators ask who could have been responsible for Megan's death, her sister doesn't hesitate. I said, Chris did it. Megan's boyfriend. And that is the only thing that made any sense to me. He asked me, why do you think Chris did it? I thought, Chris and Megan had a up and down relationship. They were like oil and water. They would be hot headed and tempered at times. Majority of the time that a, a female is killed in the United States is someone that knew. As quick as we could, we want to talk to him. He is a very hot suspect. Coming up, police learn Megan's love life is more complicated than it first appears. Another person had actually been in a relationship with Megan. Did a dangerous love triangle lead to Megan's death? When someone is murdered like that, it's got to be a jilted lover. She had intended to leave him. That would be an absolute motive for murder. Just when detectives believe they have an airtight case, a new piece of evidence changes everything. I saw the video surveillance of that person. It caught my attention big time. Never would I have thought it would wind up like this. Detectives investigating the vicious murder of 24-year-old Megan Sharpton in Tullahoma, Tennessee, have their first suspect, her 25-year-old boyfriend, Chris Farrell. Chris and Megan, to me, had an off-and-on relationship. They were both very hot-headed at times, and there were bumps in their relationship. Once Megan and Chris got together, they were inseparable, but towards the end of Megan's life, the relationship had started growing apart at that point. As far as Chris is concerned, it was just the only person that was with her on a daily basis. That was the only thing that made sense. As detectives prepare to bring in Chris for questioning, a fresh lead comes in. The Bedford County Sheriff's Office had located her car. So I had picked up and rushed to where the car was found at. The car was sitting on out in a rural area between Tallahoma and Shelbyville, Tennessee, approximately 15 to 20 miles away from the crime scene where Megan was found. This is an odd place, odd way to leave a car. The car was, you know, that of any young person's. It was cluttery, but uh, there was none of her personal effects. Investigators do find one item that grabs their attention. 
There was a note in the vehicle in the girl's handwriting about where Megan was going. It was directions on how to get to an address. The next thing was to find this address, but there was no address that, that fit the note. The directions were to a fictitious place. In talking to her mother, I learned that she had left to go to this job. Was this the directions that she was given? Did someone lure her here with the intention of doing harm to her? The way this thing was shaping up is that she was abducted where her car was found. She was killed somewhere else and was found on uh, AWALT Road. We just sealed that car off and sent it on to the crime lab for DNA testing. Investigators then head to Megan's apartment to talk to her boyfriend, Chris. The boyfriend was the first person we looked at. He was distraught. On the night of the murder, Chris had told us that he had left for work and she had told him before he left, she had accepted a job by phone that a girl she had went to school with recommended her for this job and that um, she would return in the morning. And in fact, she didn't return. And he became worried and he had reached out to her mother. Following up on what Megan's sister, Carrie, had told them, detectives asked Chris if he and Megan had been having any problems. Chris described him and Megan's relationship as a good relationship, that they had their ups and downs like anybody else, but that he would never hurt Megan. Detectives are suspicious he might be hiding something. Why else would Megan's sister point the finger at him so readily? They asked Chris to come down to the station for further questioning. We interviewed Chris and he was visibly shaken. When pressed about his relationship with Megan, Chris changes his story. He was quite honest. He said, you know, that they didn't have the, the best relationship, that, you know, he'd been somewhat strained. He felt like that maybe she wanted him to have a better job or maybe be more career orientated. Megan was getting ready to graduate college and start her career. And I don't think Chris was there at that point in his life. He was still, you know, wanted to be young. Chris swears he had nothing to do with Megan's death. Chris's alibi was that he was at work at a local department store where the majority of the night he's going to be on or near some sort of camera. Chris tells police he left for work at 5 p.m. and was there past midnight. But until his alibi can be confirmed and Megan's time of death is determined, he remains on the suspect list. From my interview with Chris, I learned that there was another person that lived in the house, Robbie Rosar. Robbie was one of Chris's friends. He moved in there at the end. My first thought was Robbie hurt Megan. I'd never met in my life that I know, you know, nothing about other than what Megan told me. He was a little rough around the edges, but Megan loved everyone. I reached out that day and I asked him to come in. Robbie was a different person. Robbie was a little darker, a little less happy person. Investigators ask Robbie point blank where he was when Megan was murdered. Robbie didn't have an alibi. Robbie showed us he had been texting her all night, even even in the morning, worried about her. He said, look, I'm not the killer. I want y'all to find out who killed Megan. And he was very, very adamant. He wanted to prove his innocence, which was a good indication for me that he didn't do this. But when detectives ask Robbie about the nature of their relationship, his answer leaves them stunned. Robbie told me that he had actually been in a relationship with Megan, that they were in fact lovers, and that she had intended to leave Chris. It was a shocker. Megan had told me a few weeks before her murder that her and Robbie had started to develop more of a relationship versus just friends. When Chris knew about Robbie, that would be an absolute motive for murder. And so, uh, again, that's when we thought, did Chris do this, you know? If things got crazy and tensions got high and emotions ran high, this would be a motive for homicide. A day after 24-year-old Megan Sharpton was violently killed, 
detectives suspect jealousy could have motivated her murder. Megan was having an affair, but did her boyfriend Chris know? When someone is murdered like that, you always think it's got to be someone close to her. It's got to be like a jilted lover. We brought Chris back in the interview room after speaking with Robbie, and we kind of dropped that bombshell on him just to see his reaction. It turns out Chris did not know about the relationship. Chris was upset. He was visibly upset when he found out that Megan had had relations with Rob, but he maintained that he still loved her and that he'd never hurt her. Chris was sincere, and I believe that was true. Both of them individually took polygraphs. The questions asked were very pointed, you know. Did you cause Megan's death? They were very straight up. They both passed. When Chris and Rob's polygraph came in, it moved them down on the list of suspects. You can't really take them off the list of suspects. They're just simply too close to the victim. But it did move them down. Putting Chris and Robbie on the back burner, detectives turned to the job offer Megan received the night she was killed. Could that have been connected to her death? After the polygraph, I start mulling over Chris's interview and the original nuggets that he had given me about the job. He had told us that that he thought that it had come in from a girl she had went to school with previously. He had said that I only remember her name is Naomi. Investigators search through school records and discover Megan had a classmate named Naomi Jones finding her to talk to her about the possibility that she recommended this job to Megan was going to be very important had this job possibly led to her death. I went to Naomi's residence. I knocked on the door. Nobody there. I drug out my lawn chair and I sat in the front and I'm going to wait. I'm going to get this statement today. The neighbor kept looking over there like, who is this crazy guy? And I was like, you know, I need to talk to Naomi Jones. He knew the Joneses well enough to have called her. When talking to Naomi, I said, hey, you know, I'm Todd Hyman. I'm with the Franklin County Sheriff's Office. I'm investigating the death of, of Megan Sharpton. Naomi stated that, you know, she knew Megan. They weren't close. She went to school with the year before in nursing school. I learned that they um, rode to clinicals maybe once together, and she offered up the fact that her husband had drove them. Further talking to her, I learned that she didn't really like Megan for whatever reason. She was very to the point and said, you know, I, would, I wouldn't recommend that girl for anything. Naomi says she has no knowledge of Megan's job offer or her death. While investigators consider their next move, the autopsy report comes in and it contains a surprising detail. The cause of death was a gunshot wound to the face and blunt force trauma. She was burned, so the soot had kind of hid the wound. Megan was shot with the medical examiner's office believes to be a 22 caliber round. Her skull was broken in several pieces. It's very possible she was hit with a pistol and shot with a pistol. The autopsy revealed she was deceased at the time of the fire. She was purposefully burned in an attempt to hide evidence. The autopsy indicates the fire was set shortly before Megan's body was discovered at 1.18 a.m. on July 2nd. Her time of death was likely before midnight. Her last moments alive were pretty terrifying. The report also confirms what police suspected at the scene. The doctor that performed the autopsy said that there was a prevalence of sexual assault. There was DNA present. I started feeling like there could be a resolution more quickly with that piece of evidence. The DNA is rushed to the crime lab for analysis. Then, two days after Megan's death, detectives get another possible lead. July the 4th. There was a guy in the creek fishing who found Megan's purse along with her driver's license, social security card. We never did find her cell phone. Megan's cell is still missing, but investigators order her phone records, hoping they might point to her killer. As the days start to pass by, 
Megan's family becomes anxious for answers. Ten days after they found her body, we decided to raise a reward for any information leading to the killer of Meg's case. Many in town begin to wonder if Megan's murder is connected to another high-profile investigation. It was the same time frame as the Holly Bobo case that was going on. It was a whodunit, just as ours. It was in uh, Darden, Tennessee, which wasn't too far from here. And, you know, immediately some citizens would ask me, do you think there's any connection? As detectives compare both cases, they have a chilling realization. Holly Bobo was a nursing student also. She was abducted from her home. I don't believe her body had been recovered. We obviously had to look at the parallels. Was it a nursing student serial killer? It's another lady that's somewhere to go. You've got a killer running around. Who is he going to kill next? Two weeks after Megan Sharpton was murdered, investigators are searching for a link to the unsolved disappearance of another nursing student in a nearby town a year earlier. The Holly Bobo case became of uh, interest to us, and our investigators reached out to theirs. There was concern that we may be dealing with a serial killer. While detectives from both cases work together to establish a link, rumors sweep through the community. I was terrified to go out at night. I didn't like going places I wasn't familiar with, and I lived in fear almost of just everyone. With Megan's killer still at large, the sense of loss begins to overwhelm her family. I was really hoping that it would be solved pretty quickly because it was consuming mom minute by minute. I could feel her emptiness when Megan passed away. She was never the same again. It absolutely became a mission. I know if it had been my child, I would want somebody to have went that extra mile, to work that extra hour, to find the resolution to, to what had happened. Finally, three weeks into the investigation, police get the results from the forensic search of Megan's vehicle. It came back with no evidence. They didn't find anything that shouldn't have been there. There was nothing of value found. Detectives hope tests on the DNA found inside Megan's body will yield better results. Her approximate time of death was before midnight, so investigators circle back to her boyfriend's alibi. He said he was working at the time that that happened. Chris was working as a cashier on the evening shift. We go back and pull the video. He was in the store when Megan had been killed. This is not our guy. Chris contacts police with a lead that sends the investigation in a new direction. The original phone call about this job opportunity came in to an older phone that Megan had. Chris is able to locate the phone and shows it to detectives. He was able to go back and find a number that he believed had called proposing this job. When investigators run the phone number, they get a surprising result. It was what we refer to as a burner phone. The burner phone. The fake address and the suspicious job opportunity all add up to what detectives suspected early on. She was going to a fake job interview. So if we could track that phone down, we could get to very possibly who the perpetrator was. Because burner phones don't require a registered name, the number doesn't lead to anyone. So I was able to at least track the phone to being sold at the department store here, and I called their loss prevention person. I was like, well, can you pull every one of these sales that was done? There was like 11 or 12 burner phones purchased, and we pulled video. We started looking at the mails and the questionable ones, and uh, just, you know, who looks like the most suspect person in these pictures? One of the people, paid for their phone, that burner phone, but they had their cell phone out on the camera. 
And just the demeanor and, and, and that just really caught Todd's attention. It caught my attention big time. He's already got a cell phone. He's buying this burner phone for a reason. We were able to use the, the video from the department store to follow him from the purchase, out the door, into the parking lot. Almost off camera, we saw him approach a red pickup truck. Why would you park that far out unless you were trying to avoid detection? I take the pictures of this guy and I circulate it at other departments. Within minutes, I had an identification of who this was. This guy's name was Timothy Gifford. Timmy Gifford is a local drug dealer, not the most honest person around. I put the word out that I need to find Mr. Gifford. I felt like he was our guy or he was involved. Officers soon track Timmy down and bring him to the station. We sent him down the interview room. I show him, you know, the picture of him buying the phone. We told him straight up, you're the killer and we're going to have your DNA. And Timmy was, you know, he was stressed out. He was like, you know, I'll tell you everything I know. I didn't do this. Um, it wasn't me. Timmy says he doesn't know Megan and denies speaking to her. When challenged about the burner phone, he tells police he bought it a month before the murder for someone else. He's like, uh, Donnie Jones. I was like, you gotta be kidding. Donnie Jones was a police informant. Donnie had been a bad boy for a long time. He had a very long rap sheet, thefts and drugs. Donnie Jones had served time before, and he had been accused of rape before. That right there was a real turning investigation. At first, detectives struggled to see how someone like Donnie could even be connected to Megan. We find out that Donnie was married to Naomi Jones. That was another nugget that was very interesting. Detectives had already talked to Naomi earlier in the investigation. She told police she did know Megan, but she had never recommended her for a job. Naomi was somebody that Megan went to school with. They would carpool with each other occasionally. And we found out that Naomi's husband, Donnie Jones, would drive them if the weather was bad. Naomi's connected to a male with a criminal history, and he knew Megan Sharpton. There was a lot of aha moments in this case, but that was, we're going somewhere, we, we've got something here. Three weeks after the murder of Megan Sharpton, detectives are interviewing Timmy Gifford. He tells police he bought the burner phone for Donnie Jones and divulges important details about the red truck seen in the surveillance footage. Timmy Gifford said that the truck was Donnie's and that a few days after the murder, he had replaced all the interior. And I was like, ooh, that's probably my murder vehicle right there. The carpet has been replaced. It's been completely detailed. That is a clue that you may be on the right track. Timmy also tells police Donnie traded the truck to his brother a week after the murder. Everything is pointing towards Donnie Jones. As quick as we could, we got the search warrant, and we took the truck directly to the TBI crime lab. Investigators have zeroed in on Donnie as a suspect and quickly pay him a visit. In his initial statement to me, it was something to effect of, you know, I hardly know that girl. I ain't never had no contact with her. But you knew of her? Yeah, I did know of her. I don't know much about her. I mean, I knew of her. When was the last time you talked to Megan? I don't talk, I ain't never talked to her. No, I take it back. When my old lady was going to school, one day they both needed the ride. Donnie is adamant he had nothing to do with Megan's death. His alibi was he was home with the kids. I'm with my kids all the fucking time. That's all I can do. And I got a nine month old and seven year old twin. Without something concrete showing that he was home, his alibi didn't hold water. He could have left with the children, he could have left the children with somebody. Detectives confront Donnie with Timmy's claims. This guy said he gave you this phone 
And this is the number, the last number to call her when she was alive. He said he gave a phone to me. Yeah. He ain't gave me no phone. We searched the house. We didn't come up with a lot of evidence. There was very little to be found. Donnie also consents to provide a DNA sample. While they wait on the results, detectives get the forensics back on the red truck. The truck had been cleaned, almost sanitized. Even the interior parts that I gathered off the search warrant, they didn't come back with any evidentiary value. Megan's family is briefed on the new developments. I saw the video surveillance of that person purchasing the burner cell phone. I saw somebody that none of us knew that had no association to Megan whatsoever. Todd had a name of the person who that burner cell phone was purchased for. And I just kind of shrugged my shoulders, like, OK, who is this guy? Nothing made any sense to me. Four weeks after Megan's murder, the crime lab sends investigators the results of the analysis on the DNA from Megan's autopsy. We got a DNA hit. And the hit come back, and it's Donnie Frank Jones. A supervisor of mine called Donnie up, and he's like, hey, you know, I need to meet with you. Donnie comes down to the station where detectives confront him. I said, did you and Megan Sharpton ever date? No. Did you and Megan Sharpton ever, ever just hook up, one night stand, party or something? No. Well, you were Megan Sharpton during this date, you know, the date of the homicide. No. And then uh, Todd asked, you know, why would your DNA be inside of her? And it was just, his face went, he just couldn't believe it. He got very, very, very irate, mad. After he had a moment, Donnie said, I just had sex with her. However, his initial statement of he had never been around her other than at one time kind of put him in a, in a corner. Detectives don't buy Donnie's story, but they'll need something more concrete to press charges. All we can prove right now is he had sex with her. That was a concern of the district attorney is that, you know, a consensual relationship could have left that evidence behind. Investigators have no choice but to let Donnie go. It was really frustrating for me. I was in complete disbelief. It was infuriating that he said it was consensual. And so he was allowed to walk free as they put the pieces together. Hoping to prove who was with Megan when she was murdered, detectives run a detailed search on four phones, Megan's, Donnie's, Timmy's, and the burner. We asked for a cell phone GPS analysis. They can take some technical data and plot it out on a map and show you to some certainty an area where a phone call was made. We we're in kind of a waiting pattern, hoping for phone records for the silver bullet to kind of put this thing away. The cell phone analysis will take weeks, but investigators get a chance to get Donnie off the streets when they discover a rifle in the trunk of his car. Donnie's a convicted felon. A convicted felon cannot possess firearms. Even though the rifle is determined not to be the murder weapon, it's enough to arrest Donnie. Now detectives must establish if he killed Megan Sharpton. We got him in custody. We had the DNA, but at the same time, we needed more. We need as much as we possibly could get. It's all theoretical until you can prove he murdered her. Four months after Megan's murder, investigators receive the detailed phone data and find a clear link between Megan and her killer. And I was just ecstatic. It's hell yeah. I met with Kelly and I told her in person, I know who killed your daughter.
Four months after the savage murder of Megan Sharpton, detectives have used cell phone GPS data to prove who killed the 24-year-old nursing student. That's Donnie Jones. On the night of the murder, the burner phone, I will refer to it as the murder phone, and Donnie's phone, they were in or about the same location. Timmy's phone is not involved. The murder phone and Megan's phone are talking to one another. And the cell phone records will show they were coming in contact with one another, and then they both stopped where her car was found. And I think at that time is when she was abducted. Using the, the cell phone data, we was able to show that at first that Donnie was close to the place where we believe she was abducted at. Then that he was close to the place I believe that he killed her at, and then that he was close to where the body was found. Donnie's family owned several farms in that area, and that's where we felt like that she was murdered. They gave us permission to search that area, and it's an extremely secluded place. Investigators make a telling discovery. There was a burn barrel there that caught my eye. I found a purple scarf with black stars on it. It was later identified by her sister, Carrie, as a gift that she had given Megan. I went from an absolute who done it to this guy might have done it to, oh, this guy definitely done it. The overwhelming evidence is what made the DA take that step to indict him. I was elated. I went to the Coffee County Sheriff's Department and had him brought up, and, and I arrested him. On November 5th, 2012, Donnie Jones is charged with first-degree murder, rape, and two counts of aggravated kidnapping. One attorney, that was it. He had no more to say. Never would I have thought it would wind up like this. When Donnie was charged, Mom, um, she was still pretty overwhelmed, but it was a relief to start learning that we were going to get the details of what events led up to that day. Based on the evidence collected, investigators pieced together how Donnie lured and then murdered Megan. It paints a disturbing picture of a calculating predator. So while looking into the murder phone, we started backtracking all the numbers that it had called. And there was a pattern Everyone that was called with that phone was someone that was sitting with the elderly or doing some kind of nursing in-home service. The murder phone was used just seeking out a victim. Donnie reached out to Megan. He knew well enough to go in his wife's phone and get her number out, and that's how all this started. She had known Donnie and his wife, They're not close friends, but knew them. She answered that call from Donnie. Megan was on her way to a job that didn't exist. The directions she had got were not good. She had to call our suspect. He met her, at which time he abducted her and went back to one of the family's farms. Megan Sharpson's last few minutes of life was pure hell and panic and fear. He raped her and shot her. Megan was beaten prior to being killed. He moved her from there to where he set her body on fire to try to hide his crimes. And then he went home and acted like nothing happened. Donnie Jones is just a cold-blooded killer, sexual deviant, cold-blooded killer. Seven months after Megan's murder, Donnie Jones pleads guilty, and on February 4th, 2013, he's sentenced to life without parole. I feel like there will never be enough done to him. He's sick, he's a monster. There is no reasonable explanation why he did it. There was a sense of accomplishment that we've moved so fast in finding out who killed her. Had we not have caught him, he would have reoffended. Detectives do determine Megan's murder was not connected to the Holly Bobo case. There was four people arrested in the Holly Bobo case. It had nothing to do with, with my case. If Megan hadn't lost her life, 
I feel very confident that Donnie Jones would still be out trying to trick young women. Megan put him behind bars for life. She sacrificed her life to keep everybody else in our community safe. Despite getting justice for Megan, the Sharpton family suffers another tragedy just nine months later in November 2013. Mom took her life 16 months after Megan's death. Her heart was just incredibly broken, and she made the choice she wanted to be with Megan. Yeah, he essentially killed them both. Sure did. Our family time, that's when I missed her the most. I missed that laugh. If you just heard Meg's laugh, you would be having a much better day. I miss those specific moments, those milestones that she's not going to get to be a part of. I thought Megan and I would be friends for, you know, on into adulthood. We were supposed to be together forever as best friends, as sidekicks. She was not someone you could forget. There was a memorial placed on the side of the road where she was found, and it's this beautiful giant star sculpture. It's very cool, and Megan would absolutely love it. A good-natured, fun-loving man. He was just a wonderful person. He was so funny and so charming. Enjoying his retirement years. At that point in his life, he was very content, very close to his family, his nieces and nephews is brutally gunned down a month before his wedding. It was point blank assassination. It was a big puddle of blood. Oh my God! <laughs> Investigators pieced together a series of clues. We had to look at what role that, that upcoming wedding had and what happened. They'd have their arguments, they had their differences. Was the scene staged to cover up an intentional killing? The investigation kept hitting dead end after dead end and chase down multiple suspects. It was a whodunit. We were hoping for that break to come. Revealing a plot fueled by greed. He was somebody who had had a criminal history of theft and assault. Just when police are close to making an arrest. It was like he had just got smacked in the head with a baseball bat. They uncovered damning evidence pointing to a surprising suspect. You never expect anything like this. And then all of a sudden, the kill was right in front of us. On a warm July afternoon in 2014, the sleepy Pittsburgh suburb of Kennedy Township is rocked by a panicked call to 911. Hi, me and Alan. What's going on? I just got home from work, and my husband, he's been on the ground. He's, he's, he's dead. There's a big puddle of blood. Police, fire, and ambulance are coming, OK? Oh, The woman who made the 911 call, Carol Apaya, says the victim is her soon-to-be husband, 59-year-old Jack Parks. When I arrived on scene, the first thing I noticed is that the victim's head was covered in blood. It was on closer examination that you could see it was a gunshot wound. One challenge we had right out of the gate was that there was no casing for gun found. We don't move his body until it can be photographed. It was possible there was a gun underneath him that no one had seen. So we weren't 100% sure if the gunshot wound at that point had been self-inflicted or a homicide. We looked for a while. Unfortunately, we didn't find any type of gun. Detectives searched for any signs of what happened to Jack and who pulled the trigger. It was pretty clear right off the bat that this was some type of a home invasion or robbery that occurred. It didn't look like a struggle had ensued in the room, but once you 
walked through the victim's house, the further you got into it, the more you realized the level of disarray it was in. And as you went into the dining room, you started to see jewelry box here, a drawer gone through here, papers rifled through. Upstairs, there was just complete disarray. The drawers were all pulled out. The clothing that was inside the drawers was strewn everywhere. Jewelry boxes flipped open, empty watch boxes laying there. We were trying to determine, was the scene staged? Was someone just trying to make it look like a robbery or a burglary? And when in fact, they're just trying to cover up an intentional killing where they intended just to walk in and execute somebody. The house was dusted and processed for DNA and fingerprints. We then began to process the outside of the residence, looking for any type of forced entry, and uh, none of that was found. Our first thoughts were the victim either knew the actor or was familiar with him. That's just our first impression. So, you know, who was friends with the victim, who would have access to the victim, who would have opportunity to the victim, and who would he trust? It really was a shocking case. He was killed execution style. This homicide happened in an area that we don't normally have murders. Jack's death is the first homicide in Kennedy Township in 10 years. The news stuns his family and friends. When I got that phone call and I heard Carol's voice, I knew something was wrong. And she said, Jack's gone. I said, what do you mean, gone? She said, he's dead. And then she said, he was murdered. And I just went into shock. Jack Parks was born the second of five kids in Pittsburgh in 1955. Friends and family were everything to him. Jack always made friends. He was one of the best people I've ever known. He would do anything for anybody. We first met in first grade. We hit it off all through high school. And after that, it was, it was a good ride. Jack was so well liked. He could be charming when he wanted to and funny. He was just a wonderful person. In 1989, a chance encounter changed Jack's life. Jack met Carol at the local bar, and I guess they hit it off. They were two peas in a pot. Soon as he brought Carol, we fell in love with Carol. Jack was very close to his family. He had about nine nieces and nephews. Jack and Carol used to have their nieces and nephews over for sleepovers, making the popcorn and just having a good time. You'd have swore that Jack and Carol were the parents. They didn't have kids, so when those kids were around, they were their kids. Jack had recently retired, but had big plans for the future. At that point in his life, Jack was very content. Him and Carol were going to get married. They've been together for over 25 years. Carol, in the beginning, really wanted to get married, and Jack didn't. And then at one point, Jack wanted to get married, and Carol didn't. And I used to tell Jack, you know what? I like to be living when you get married, when you say I do. And then when they set the date, I was so happy. It was going to be an exciting, very exciting day. Tragically, Jack was murdered a month before the ceremony was to take place. Her and Jack were going to be married on August 31st of that year. And it just, it was really sad. It was so close. At 5 p.m. on July 21st, Two hours after Carol found Jack dead, police questioned her at the station. Talking to Carol was so important because, first of all, we had to determine whether she was or wasn't involved. And we wanted to just get the best timeline from her. During the interview with Carol, she explained that she had left for work as usual, her normal time, about 5.40. She starts work at 6. Everything was fine when she left for work. 
It wasn't until a realtor called her about a potential buyer for Jack's late mother's home. And when the realtor couldn't get a hold of Jack, Carol started to worry. She tried to call Jack and there was no answer. So then she got concerned. He always called her back every time that she tried to get a hold of him. So I think it was approximately about two o'clock she left work and then come over and find Jack, of course. Detectives know that spouses are always the first suspect and must determine if they can trust Carol's version of events. We have a timeline between 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. when she returns home. In some cases, you know, if, if a person is a cold-blooded killer, they may have killed him before she left the house. And then all of a sudden, she finds him, and, you know, and the killer's right in front of us. Her demeanor, she was very upset. But you can't take a chance by skipping a stone and not trying to look at her. Detectives are suspicious of why it took the couple so long to decide to get married and if someone had cold feet. Something that we thought is, are either one of them having affairs with someone else? Could that be a possible motivation? And is this upcoming wedding triggering that? Coming up, detectives uncover a family feud. They just decided to distance themselves from not let him come to the house. And learn Jack's inner circle isn't as loving and devoted as it first seems. Things got more contentious. As police keep digging, more suspects surface. We learned of several burglaries. They had concerns about the employees. They hire criminals. Just when the investigation is about to hit another dead end. We had no idea who would have done this. Detectives make a crucial discovery. It was exactly what we needed. When we got the phone records back, it was, oh my god. That was an aha moment. Kennedy Township Police are investigating the area's first homicide in a decade. 59-year-old Jack Parks was found dead in his home by his fiance Carol in what appears to be a robbery. But since there was no forced entry, investigators try to determine if this was actually a staged attack and if the motive was something more personal. When we interviewed Carol, we had to look at what role, if any, that upcoming wedding had in what happened. We had to start looking at every aspect of their lifestyle. What were the family dynamics? We had to chip away at a number of things in their life, things that happened that day, but also things that might have happened in the past that could be a motivation for this murder. They had their differences. They'd have their arguments, but it wasn't my point to get involved in their squabbles. We kept talking more and more about any kind of problems that they had had in their home. And I asked her, do either of them have a gun? And she said that they did not. Carol says she would never do anything to hurt the love of her life. She wanted to marry him. Jack was her soulmate. Jack and Carol, they loved each other. They felt they were already married. To everybody, they were husband and wife years before, you know, the wedding was planned. Carol was very upset. It was very difficult to talk to her while she processed that emotion, but then to still get the information we needed to keep moving the investigation forward. To me, that was a sign that she wasn't involved. With suspicion shifting from Carol for now, Investigators explore whether theft was the main motive. The bedroom was ransacked, the mattress was disturbed, things were emptied out of drawers. Carol had indicated to me some items that should be there. Their wedding rings that they had bought. Jack collected some coins. He had some expensive watches. She indicated that the watches should be in the boxes. When we first processed the areas of disarray, none of those items were there. That was our first big clue to go off of. I knew that if we could find that jewelry, we could find who was involved. We didn't know if the person who took it might have given it to someone else, but we had to start with where is it, who has it, and how did they get it? The next morning, the autopsy report comes in. 
He was taken out with one shot and to the right side of his head. It took it to a level where you know that is someone who probably came there with the intent to either use that weapon to intimidate or control Jack. There was a projectile that was recovered from his skull, and we were able to determine that we were looking for this 380. So that was a good start for us. Now we knew what kind of gun we were looking for. During the victim's autopsy, you could see that there were no wounds on his hands at all. There were no scratches. There were no broken fingernails. Nothing that seemed to indicate that he had had a chance to fight back. He had been caught completely off guard. During Carol's interview, she indicated to police that Jack's nephew, Bradley Johnson, is someone they should look into. Bradley was living across the street with his mother and father, across the street from Jack. And he was always over there. And from what I understand, he was one of the last ones to see Jack alive. We made contact with Bradley, and Bradley had told us that he had gone over to Jack's house on the 21st, and he said he got there around 10.30 in the morning. Detectives find that timing suspicious. They know Jack was killed sometime between 6 a.m. and 3 p.m. that day. I asked him, I said, Bradley, what did you go over there to talk to him about? He said, well, Jack's mother had passed away and he knew that Jack was looking to sell the home. But Bradley wanted to negotiate a deal with Jack and he wanted to talk to Jack alone because he said, you know, I just, I don't want Carol weighing in on this. I want this to be a, a Parks family matter and I want to discuss it with him. In his words, I didn't want her putting her two cents in. And that was a phrase that seemed to hint at some kind of animosity. Bradley tells investigators that he finds Carol too controlling and that she shouldn't have a say in this family decision. Jack wanted to wait until he could talk with Carol about it, which sort of defeated the purpose of why Bradley had gone there when she wasn't home. So he said he ended up leaving and they were gonna revisit the conversation later. As investigators press him further, Bradley reveals an alarming fact. We did ask him about any firearms that he owned. And when Bradley told us he owned a 380 caliber pistol, it kind of was like, okay, this may be something, maybe something broke bad because now we know Carol leaves for work at 6 a.m. and Jack's alive at 10.30 because Brad's telling us he's over there. He indicated he had left about 11.15. With Bradley's timeline, it definitely seemed that Bradley was very close in time to when Jack would have been killed. And he put himself there. He had the same type of gun. Had the discussion about Jack's mother's house turned fatal? With the timing of Bradley's conversation with Jack, it made me wonder whether things got more contentious than he was alluding to in my interview with him, or did he leave there upset, or did somebody else come back and do something to Jack? It had to be looked into. Twelve hours after Jack Parks was found dead, Investigators chase down leads around their latest person of interest, Jack's nephew, Bradley Johnson. When I found out that Bradley was a suspect, I was mad. I was really upset, knowing that they thought that. But then again, when it comes to an investigation, police are doing their job. Bradley and Jack had a disagreement, and he admits to owning the same caliber gun. So that definitely stepped up our interest in Bradley. This is a gun that we needed to take a look at. Bradley's gun was uh, collected, taken to the lab where it was test fired. The ballistics on the gun did not match the projectile that was recovered from Jack yeah, when he autopsy. With nothing concrete linking Bradley to the murder, he is dropped as a suspect. Detectives also corroborate Carol's alibi. On the day that this happened, we were able to verify that she was at work and she was accounted for at that time. We were able to eliminate Carol as a suspect. Looking for new leads, detectives speak to the other nieces and nephews who were close to Jack. During our interview of Carol, she had told us about her nephew, Michael LaPaya, who was 
almost like a son to her. And you know, he had been at the house a lot. They got along good. Michael joined the military. Jack was very proud of Michael. Jack took pride in the nieces and nephews because he watched them grow up. Michael was brought in to the homicide office and interviewed about Jack's murder. And during that interview, Michael had said that he was unemployed. He was trying to seek help through the VA hospital due to his PTSD from being in the Army. Michael had been discharged from the military due to his use of uh, cannabis. Michael also admits he'd fallen out with the family, including his aunt and uncle, and hadn't seen them in a year. He specifically denied being over near the victim's house, and he made reference to them being estranged. Michael had a bit of a drug problem, and Carol and Jack decided to distance themselves from Michael and not let him come to the house. Detectives still need to know where Michael was when Jack was killed. We knew Carol left around 6 a.m. We knew that Bradley was there about 10.30. We knew Carol found him around 3 o'clock. So there's a window of opportunity of about four hours. He told us he was at home in Sharpsburg on the day of the incident, July 21st, 20 minutes away from Jack's house. He said that his girlfriend had kind of unexpectedly taken the day off and they spent the day together. Nothing out of the ordinary. He gave us some landmarks on our timeline that we could check out. Michael and his girlfriend, Melanie, had gone and done some shopping in the town that they lived in. He said that he had had a doctor's appointment at the VA hospital later that afternoon. These were things at businesses and locations that we could check from doing surveillance video or getting sales transactions. Michael's girlfriend, Melanie, did corroborate his activities, and she stated they had spent the day together. It was determined that his alibi had checked out. A day into the investigation, with Jack's closest circle cleared, investigators escalate the search for the missing jewelry. We were physically going to many pawn shops to try to see if anybody had sold this jewelry. We didn't get any traction with that. That's when we started doing a canvas of the neighborhood. When we were doing our neighborhood canvas, so many people had mentioned near their house, there's a meat factory, and they had concerns about the employees. We had heard things like they hire people with records, they hire criminals. From talking to Carol, she said they have a straight view into Carol and Jack's home. And Jack had mentioned sometimes he would let people use his phone or use the bathroom when they were on their break. And it upset her. In a case like this, you may see, hey, look at this guy. He got some gold on. It's a crime of opportunity. We knew that they got their morning break right around the time when people stopped hearing from Jack. So we definitely wanted to look into that and see what the consensus was over there. I think we did like almost 40 interviews of all the employees to see who they were. One worker in particular piques police interest. Ronald Levins was a name that came up from multiple employees in the context of people who had gone over to Jack's. This may be the person that Carol was aware that had come over there. Ronald Levins was somebody who had had a criminal history of petty theft and assault. So he was on our radar for sure. Investigators work quickly to bring Ronald in for an interview. Ronald indicated that he had known Jack and they were actually friendly, and that's why he was allowed to come into the house when Carol wasn't home. Carol said she would get upset with Jack. She would say, Jack, don't just let anyone in our house. You can't do that. And he would just, you know, kind of shrug it off. But she just didn't want people coming into the house that she didn't know. Investigators ask Ronald point blank if he had anything to do with Jack's murder. He said he had no involvement in Jack's death. But the day that Jack was killed, Ronald didn't come to work. He had actually taken scheduled vacation for Friday and Monday. Ronald Blevins' alibi checked out and we were able to eliminate him as a suspect in this case. Desperate for a new lead, investigators look for similarities with other robberies in the area. 
After Jack's murder, we talked to the local authorities, and during that, we learned of several burglaries, one of which an older lady was burglarized, and about $5,000 worth of quarters were taken. Jack's killer had stolen his coins as well as jewelry. Is this the same person? And could they strike again? The neighbors were very afraid. We still have a killer out there. It was a whodunit. Once something like this happened, you think that anything's possible now. Police investigating the cold-blooded shooting of Jack Parks suspect his murder could be linked to another recent robbery in the neighborhood. We learned that during that burglary, there were some items similar to what Jack had that were taken, and it was a burglary that happened during the day, which is the timeline we were looking at in this particular incident. Oftentimes in our investigations, we see that residential burglaries are done during the day in bedroom communities where the chance of the people inside the home being at work are better. And that way they can go in and they can take what they need without fear of being caught. With Jack being retired and home all day, had he caught the burglar red-handed and paid the ultimate price? The neighboring police department already has a suspect in custody. Vernon Zielinski was identified as a possible suspect in this case. He had been recently arrested. The items that Vernon was accused of taking were coins, while Jack had coins that were missing. So Vernon Zielinski was tracked down, and he was interviewed. We really just wanted to do an interview and determine what connection, if any, he had to Jack. During the interview, he said that he had been arrested for the burglary, but that burglary was at an old employer's house. He denied knowing Jack, and he said that the day that this happened, he was actually at work. We confirmed that through his new employer, that he was working that day, during the time frame that this would have occurred. Vernon was somebody we were absolutely able to rule out of being directly involved. At that stage in the investigation, we had no idea who might have done this and why. 48 hours after Jack's murder, with no arrests in the case, fear is growing in Kennedy Township. Everyone was concerned that how in broad daylight can someone walk into a house, kill somebody, and walk out without even being seen. The hardest thing to comprehend was the murder. It was point blank assassination. Stone cold killing. You never expect anything like this. I know I didn't. Waiting for an arrest, you're still in that daze of trying to process it all. He's not coming back. It's just too unbelievable. Is this going to be another murder unsolved? We had a lot of information to go on, and we were constantly moving the investigation forward. People were being eliminated. Further suspects were being developed. Three days after Jack was discovered dead, police get a major break. A local pawn shop in Sharpsburg PA, which is another small little borough within Allegheny County. The owner had called uh, the local police due to some suspicious activity. On the day of the incident, July 21st, he said a gentleman came in with a cache of gold and was trying to sell it to him. What the employee found to be concerning was, first of all, the jewelry was manipulated. It was very distinguishable pieces, but they had been, it seemed to be hammered or just manipulated in a way that would make them hard for law enforcement to identify. It threw up a red flag to him, but also he seemed to think that this was a person who had sold him stolen jewelry in the past. So he didn't buy the jewelry, but he also had the foresight to know he wanted to see where the jewelry might have come from. He knew it was important to get a picture of it. So he took a photograph of the items that this person was trying to sell. He provided us with the photographs, and they were taken to Carol, who viewed them. She became very upset. She started crying, and she said, that's our jewelry. 
It felt like we were closing in. Based upon the photograph of the jewelry, we were able to get that out to the local department. They could share it with the pawn shop owners in town if anyone comes in with this. Investigators hope they can identify the seller. The pawn shop owner was able to give a good description of the person who brought the jewelry in, a younger white male, black hair, and a thin build. That description was provided to the local police chief in Sharpsburg, and he thought that fit the description of a white male from that area. It gave us a very good lead in this case. A photo array was put together to include eight individual photographs, and they were shown to the shop owner. We have a set of instructions that we give them, and we say, the person that we're looking for may or may not be in here, but if you see the person, indicate it on the lineup. So once he reviewed the photo array, he did identify who that person was. It was a huge break. It was exactly what we needed. Coming up, police find stunning evidence pointing to Jack's killer. In the video, we knew exactly who it was. This was a shock to everyone. You never thought that would happen. It would be that person. But making an arrest wouldn't be easy. She provided alibis for him and just denials. Until investigators find proof no one can deny. Those records don't lie. Detectives have just identified the man who tried to pawn murder victim Jack Park's jewelry. His name? Brian Gibbons. He's been a known thief to the local police department. We went after that late strong. We were feeling pretty confident that Mr. Gibbons may be our man, or at least know who our man was. We were very excited and very motivated to go find him. Brian has a long history of petty crimes, but investigators need to determine if he's a killer. Four days after the murder, they get a warrant to search his home. Specifically, we were looking for any of the very distinguishing items that Jack Parks had. Unfortunately, we didn't find any of the victim's jewelry in the house, but we did find some items that did turn out to be stolen from someone else. Based upon the search at Mr. Gibbons' residence, we were able to arrest him and have him sent to the county jail. Investigators questioned Brian about Jack's missing jewelry. He said that he didn't have anything to do with it. At that point, we were trying to determine if perhaps he'd been given some jewelry to sell, that maybe he didn't know its origin and he went to go sell it. We really just wanted to see if we could come up with any connection to rule him either in or out on the homicide of Jack Parks. Brian tells detectives he doesn't know the victim and has never been to his home. He said he had no connection to Jack at all. He denied having any knowledge of the Jack Parks homicide. We asked, well, what's your alibi? And he goes, I was arrested for entering an abandoned house that day. And that was confirmed. Brian was not the killer. He had a solid alibi. It was clear that he was not the same individual who had come in to the store on that Monday and tried to sell the jewelry. The pawn shop owner mistakenly identified the wrong person. The investigation kept hitting dead end after dead end. We thought we had it, but then once we eliminated him, we took a pause. We had to step back a minute, not start all over, but then keep everything else in perspective. While detectives hunt for new leads, Jack's loved ones struggle with their grief. Instead of looking forward to Jack's wedding, five days after his murder, they attend his funeral. When he told me he was going to get married, his brother and I would have stood up for him. I was proud, because I was never a best man. And there I was carrying his casket. God, to have something like that happen in such a quick time, it's devastating to everybody. You feel the hurt, but it really doesn't sink in until the funeral's all over. And then the shock is over, it's reality. He's gone. Fearing the case could go cold, 
A week after the murder, police step up the hunt for Jack's stolen jewelry, hoping the culprit is still attempting to sell it at a pawn shop. We all just sort of fanned out, and we took particular geographical areas. We knew there was still a person that was out there trying to sell Jack's jewelry, and we had to just keep holding out hope that the pawn shop would take their identification, that they would keep good records. That's what kept us going, honestly. There is a, a detective in the city of Pittsburgh who is a pawn shop records analyst, and I reached out to her and I told her what items that we had missing. And on August 4th, I heard back from her and she told me that she had found the jewelry where it had been sold. Investigators raced to the pawn shop. We had to go take a physical look at it, see who, if anybody, was on camera. Some store policies, all they have to do is take an individual's driver's license number. They don't even have to make a photocopy of it. So we were trying to remain optimistic that somehow we would get an image of the actual person who tried to sell that jewelry. It could have been anyone at that point. The pawn shop has surveillance video, and what detectives see on tape is jaw-dropping. It was, oh my God. We knew exactly who it was. In the video, it was Michael Lapaio, which was Carol's nephew that Jack raised like one of his own. This was a shock to everyone. When we first had dealings with Michael early on in the investigation, he did provide an alibi about businesses he was at, doctor's appointments. Michael had his girlfriend, Melanie, saying that he was with her during the time that Jack would have or could have been killed. So it was kind of going back, trying to retrace what he had initially told us. We still had to do a little bit more digging. We had to work on if we were missing something. Early on, when we talked to Michael, he had given detectives his phone number. I wanted to get his phone records. While investigators wait for those records, they call Michael back in. We are going to interview him and uh, see what he has to say now that we have him on tape pawning his uncle's jewelry. We decided that it would probably be ideal to bring Michael and his girlfriend Melanie in at the same time, being that she was the person who was providing an alibi for him and chip away at that and see where the truth lied. We took them both back to our office and they were interviewed in separate rooms. Michael, in his interview, was initially very adamant that he had nothing to do with this. He denied involvement with the murder, involvement with the jewelry, and he just would not deviate from that. Melanie stands by her story, too. She provided alibis for him and just denials. Melanie is pretty much telling us that he was with her during the time that Jack would have or could have been killed. She was just defensive and trying to argue with what we knew was not true. And that was that he had sold Jack's jewelry. We showed her a picture of the jewelry and she tried to say it was hers. And we knew that was a lie. With neither Michael nor Melanie cracking under the pressure, detectives need something to break the deadlock. When we got the information about the cell phone records, it was a huge break. We were very happy that it finally had come through. It was like everything came full circle. Two weeks after Jack Parks was shot to death in his own home, investigators get the break in the case they needed, incriminating cell phone GPS data. When I got Michael's phone records, I started to see where generally he spent most of his time, which was consistent with his home. He told us he was in Sharpsburg, 20 minutes away from Jack's house on the day of the incident. Parts of his alibi checked out, cell phone data-wise, but there was an anomaly where about 11.45, his cell phone pinged over in the area of Jack and Carol's house. To me, the significance of 11.45 was it is in this time where Carol can't reach Jack. It would be impossible to be in 
Sharpsburg and your phone ping off a tower in Kennedy Township. The amount of distance between the two, it wouldn't be possible. He was not at home. He was over near his uncle's house. So 11.45, Michael's phone being over there was an aha moment. Those records don't lie. Detectives want to see how Michael will react when confronted with his own cell phone records. It was like he had just got smacked in the head with a baseball bat. He became very quiet, took a second, and he just let it all out. I was suffering from PTSD, and the morning of July 21st, I asked Mel to take a ride with me. She just drove down with me, and I parked her car. And I told her to wait. She never got out of the car. She had no clue where we were going. Michael's explanation of why he went to see Jack only raises more suspicion. But a year ago, I was accused of stealing jewelry, and I wanted to make amends. I wanted to fix it. I knocked on a door to apologize and talk. At that time, he came hostile, and he choked me and swung at me. His story changed to self-defense. He had two hands around my neck. And at that time, I, I felt my life was threatened. And I had a pistol, 380 on me. It went off. Reconciling that just wasn't possible. Jack was shot one time, right close to his ear. Basically, someone held a gun to his head and executed him. He fell to the floor, and I panicked. Ren grabbed jewelry, and I left. Michael tells detectives he sold the jewelry for $1,000. Even more shocking is what he spent the money on. You stated that that's one of the people you sometimes purchase narcotics from. Yes. I gave him about six or $700. In addition to that, several days later, what did he give you? He gave me heroin. Michael was following a path of substance abuse that was getting to be more addictive drugs, and his use was increasing. It wasn't recreational anymore. It was more the behavior of an addict. It was heartbreaking for us to know that someone who was almost like Jack's son, a very close family member, would do something like that in exchange for a couple of dollars to get high. I believe Michael went to that house to take jewelry. He knew Jack was there, and the only way he was going to get that jewelry is if Jack was dead. He walked up to the house, and as soon as Jack met him at the door and turned his back to him, he shot him, and he fell, and he died instantly. On August 5th, 2014, Michael LaPaya is charged with first-degree murder. To say to Carol, we know who did this, it was hard, but the hardest answer that we had for her is when she said, Michael who? And he had the same last name as her, really. It was hard to tell her that, it's your nephew. And it just hit her, and she was very upset. You never thought that would happen. It would be that person. It's still to this day so hard to believe that somebody that they loved, Michael, could have done something like this. I mean, what he did, I can't describe. There's no words. At trial, Michael is found guilty. On December 9th, 2015, the 24-year-old is sentenced to life in prison. He took a loving, caring man and just executed him. There was no winners. We lost Jack. Who won? Nobody. I would never forgive him. Michael took away my best friend, my brother. He took away a lot from me. To this day, I still hate the guy. Jack will never be forgotten. In the beginning, it's hard talking about a loved one without really breaking down crying. But you continue to talk about him. You keep their memory alive. And that's how he stays with us. 
every day. He's here in my mind, my heart, and my dreams. I see his face, always smiling. I know he's flying with the angels. <laughs>